You killed Apollo's priests. Killed men in five countries. You were a priest. Well, then your men did. Sun God will have his vengeance. What's he waiting for? The right time to strike. His priests are dead and his acolytes are captive. I think your God is afraid of me. And we're here. Hello. We're doing our thing. Yes. Episode 7. Rates Radio here again. Yeah. Episode 7. Slightly more on time than last episode. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah. Life gets in the way. It does. It does. Until you this ever, is our job. Do you have a good week while we uh, were recording? Um, yeah. You know, it's like, you know, you, everybody's got their list of shit they need to get sorted out. And I've got a few <laughs> things off, off, the, uh, off the list which were pretty important. So, yeah. Oh, good, good. Um, I can't remember if last time I was on I mentioned if I if it was after or before I sliced my finger open. Oh, I think it was after. How's that? Is that it's recovering? After. Yeah, it's recovering all right. I've just still got it under wraps, but uh, it's it's healed up mostly. Yeah, I've got so many cuts on my fingers from work. I don't know where to start. My my fingerprint reader on my other laptop won't work now. Oh, I've wonderful! So many cuts. <laughs> Brilliant. It's like great. Okay, yeah, my fingers no longer look like my fingers. So yeah, that was fantastic. Yeah, but my job's pretty hard on my hands. Yeah. So, but annoyingly, keeps my hands really soft. So I've got really soft hands, but like the hands of a construction worker if they use lots and lots of hand cream. <laughs> uh, so Dave Canterbury will never shake my hand. Too soft. Wait, no, he did this thing about you know hard working hands, and it's like I work fucking hard, but my hands yeah. are in soapy water all the time. It's like you know. <laughs> Dude, I lift heavy shit, you know. I'm constantly endangered by my co-workers. <laughs> oh my. I remember you mentioned that. Oh, it pisses me off, man. I, I really would like to put a lot of them through, like, an army weekend. Ooh, yeah. Or a ranger weekend and make them fend for themselves in the woods. I put. There were a few people, I said, we should do a team building thing in the woods. And they went, yeah. And then I talked about what they'd have to do. And they went, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, oh, I had an boy. embarrassing thing last night. Somebody said, you know, you, you, you know, sort of what makes you happy. And in a flippant moment, I just went, knives. Knives make me happy. <laughs> you know, the kind of like, I was trying to do the whole space thing. How does this make you feel? <laughs> Mike. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a picture of me looking just like Mike with my cookery nice. in my hand. Um, which I've got to get off there, uh, Andrew, and uh, get that across. I might have yeah. to put that on. But there's a picture of me looking so pleased to have got my 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 designer cookery finally. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and they went, well, how many knives you got? I went, well, you know, excluding knives in the kitchen. And I started counting up, and I got to about fifteen and stopped counting. <laughs> I went, that makes me come across like a psycho, doesn't it? And they went, yep. It's like, <laughs> you know, why do you need fifteen knives? And it's like, well, you know. Some knives are better. A better knife comes out and you go, oh. And some of them are like, you know, quite cheap and, you know, get good reviews. And you think, well, I'll throw a tenner at that and see what that looks like. Yeah. So some of my knives are just like, you know. Throw away. I wanted to tr- well, not throw away because, I mean, they're, they're the ones that I've got, I've been really lucky. Um, oh, I'm, sorry. Not, I'm not I mean, pushing like... any particular company, but Ganzo folding knives. Oh, some of those are fantastic. Um, it's a well, Chinese I... company that just basically does slightly changed copies of like really expensive folding knives. Yeah. So like the um, Lion Steel H1 is like one hundred and eighty dollars. Mm-hmm. So like never going to buy a folding knife for one hundred and eighty dollars because these days it translates one hundred and eighty quid. That's a week's pay. Yeah. No, no <laughs> way. No way am I spending that. And then Ganzo bring one out that instead of the Oz Eight or Ozo, you know, some kind of designer steel. Is like 440C, which is perfect for a knife. Yeah. As long as you're not going to abuse the shit out of it and you're prepared to sharpen it and, you know, it'll stay sharp for a long time. But for like a tenner. There you go. Well, well, I, do you I remember? Quite, quite like the design of that. I'll give it a go. Do you remember when we bought those Mora Vikings? Yeah, I've still got one of those. Yeah, yeah £2.50. Same. It was, yeah, it was £2.50 a knife. Yeah, it was I gave away. I must have bought a dozen of those and given them all away. Yeah. It was yeah. a proper score. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, that's a good knife. And even on, you know, Dave Canterbury's channel, when he's going, oh, if you want a companion knife, just get a Mora. Yeah, mm. any Mora. They're all pretty much the same. The only thing that changes on Mora is occasionally the blade is thicker, but it's yeah. still not a knife you're going to batten with. And occasionally, um, it's a different handle. 
the only things that vary are the, the handle shapes and the colours, really, for the bulk of Mora knives. So you might as well just get a cheap one that's comfortable and is grippy. And if it ain't grippy enough, just get yourself a, an old inner tube, which you should have anyway. This is fucking brilliant for lighting fires. You put it around the handle. And put it around the handle and the fucker won't slip. You know, it takes you five minutes. And then you'll have enough left over in a tube to do all sorts of other sensible shit. I've just put in a tube on all my lighters, my disposable lighters. Oh, yeah. Well, one, it makes them easier to pick up in your pocket because they're grippy. It does. But also, you've got like a fire lighter wrapped around the thing. That, mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this the other day. What are the advantages of having rubber on the handle of a lighter? Is that you can get it off quite easily. Um, but also, um, as, a, as a kind of like, I am in deep fucking trouble. If you're in a building and you're in deep fucking trouble and you mm -hmm. haven't got time to, for the police to get their shit together, you can set off a smoke alarm with it. You light a piece of oh, rubber yeah. and you hold it under a smoke alarm and it's an expensive enough building. I'm telling you, burly cops yeah, of men off. will be there within five minutes. Like a fucking lot of them. So if, so, if you're if you're in like really big danger from people, set off the fire alarm. So, um, just had a look, I just having a gander at the price of some more stuff at the moment. Yeah. Um, the the Springfields sell um more knife blade blanks. Are those the like look with the little st short stubby tangs? No, they've got full tangs. Oh, they do a more a full tang blank. Yeah, they're not, they're not they're not the same thickness as the blade, obviously. Well, they're not sorry, they're not the same width as the blade, but the full tangs. All right. Um, less than eight quid. Yeah, I do like the more uh, robust mm. um, blade. That's about two and a half to three millimeters thick. Yeah. Because I, I do like a thick knife. Not because I batten. I've had a big convo with someone on the internet about this. Because I don't think you should have to batten. And it fucks up your knife. And it causes the um, actual edge to roll. Which means it will yeah. start folding underneath itself. That's why axes are the shape they are. You know, well, axes, that's why you have an axe, axes really. Axes cut wood. Axes split wood. They just do it with yeah. weight and force. In the same way tomahawks work. Um, yeah. But... Uh, so I would, you know, if it was your only tool and you absolutely had to split a piece of wood, then yeah, maybe. But uh, you mm -hmm. know, carrying axe, people. Um, I say that's what you are. Kind of why you have an axe. It's yes, split that's why wood. you have an axe or a hatchet is so you split wood or a wedge. You can make a wedge mm -hmm. if you've got a knife. Make a make a hardwood wedge, and if if you've got a saw or or, or you, with your knife, make it cut a divot like a little V in the top of the log you want to split. Put the wedge in mm -hmm. it, and then take a big bit of wood and beat the shit out of it, and it will split. And that way yeah. you've set, you've preserved your knife using a bit of wood that you don't care about. More sell camp axes now. Yeah, I've seen the camp axe. I haven't I haven't seen anything that's Halter Fours make a good axe, and it's made by the same people that make the Gransfors Brooks. So if you don't have a Gransfors yeah. Brooks, a Halter Fours will give you a good axe. Military Mart sell a military axe, like a Norway a Scandinavian axe that's made but in the same way as a as a Gransfors Brooks and about the same mm -hmm. length because the small forest axe of Gransfors Brooks has got just enough swing that it delivers you know like that whole lever action thing there's a there's a perfect length for an axe oh, and yeah. it's about 18 inches or so and that will give you enough swing to sort of like split and cut wood and fell small trees I mean felling a tree with a small axe is not fun no, <laughs> you know, look around for any other alternative for shelter building. You know, but if you if if you were stuck somewhere and you thought, right, I'm going to make the best of this. Once you've got your comfy shelter built, and you you think, right, I'm going to be here for like you know weeks, months, years, I will start building a, like a reasonable house. Then it's worth thinking about felling wood. Once you've got everything else ironed out. But yeah, yeah it, I'm not it, it, in America. I can see it being a thing. But generally speaking, if you are building a log cabin in the woods as a sort of a getaway, you're going to use a chainsaw. Oh, yeah. Because why would you not? You know, chainsaws are way, way quicker. And uh, just as portable. And, and an axe is the hard way. And yes, learn how to do it the hard way, you know. Um, but if you don't have to, don't. In a survival situation, you should be conserving all your energy. Exactly. But yeah, knives. 
Yeah, but def def definitely check out Ganzo Knives. I'm I'm pretty fond. The they do a copy of the Spiderco Paramilitary 2 for like fourteen dollars, including shipping on Gearbest. Oh, nice! And it's an amazing, amazing knife. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. It's just the shape of it. I mean, a lot of the time, the shape of a knife is what makes it good. So mm -hmm. the handle, the shape of the blade, the thickness and the angle of the blade are what sort of like makes the knife good. Yeah. And, you know, the steel is, you know, to some people a bonus. And yes, if you're spending a couple of hundred dollars, you don't want 440C steel. No. You want them to have spent some money on a really amazing bit of steel, you know, or a laminate or whatever fancy bit. But generally speaking, for, you're never going to use a pocket knife for anything other than whittling or opening boxes. Not really. You know, if if you have to use a knife to defend yourself, it has all gone totally wrong. And whatever yeah. knife you have in your pocket is the knife you've got. And, you know, a sharp pointy thing with a nice blade on it will do. You know. What if it's got a pointed stick? Yes, a pointed stick. As long a pointed stick as you possibly can lay to hand. A fire-hardened spear will be better than a knife. In yeah. the words of uh, Watson from the, the season three of Sherlock, where the guy goes, I'm going to stab you. And Watson just goes, not from there. <laughs> just, just, right, that's that's knife fighting in a nutshell. You know, you are close. That person wants to kill you. If you want to continue breathing, you have got to like chop them into bits. Yeah. And it, it takes a long time to die from a knife wound. You know, you have to... Basically, a knife is there to discourage someone and possibly at some future time, hours from now, make you die. Mm -hmm. But no, you know, if there is a knife fight, both people tend to have to go to hospital. There's no good knife fight. You know, and if that other person doesn't have a knife, then you probably don't need to pull yours. Yeah. Because the moment you produce a weapon, there's a very good chance it will be taken off you and used on you. So exactly. Knives are tools. You know, imagining pulling a knife in, in, in a combat situation is a bit like, I would rather have like one of those big adjustable wrenches. Or a hammer. I would... I would... I would even say that having a staff would yeah, be better a than a knife. It, or a it, stick, yeah. Yeah. Every motherfucker's got a stick. Look at everybody in the world. First thing they pick up. If you put someone in the middle of nowhere with nothing, they'll pick up a stick first. Yep. Pick up a stick, get a pointy end on it. Well, if someone comes at you with a knife, yeah. you can just smack their hand. Well, yeah. I mean, the spear uh, as a weapon... Mm. I think There's a had... reason why the spear was so used for so long. Well, we abandoned the spear in 1690. Yeah. That's the British, and we've been being aggressive to people for thousands of years. Yeah. So all that time, up until 1690, so before history, till 1690, a big pointy stick was a good idea. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until people could throw bits of lead at you from hundreds of yards away that we thought, hmm, this does not the really have no the range. Anymore. And yeah. The weird thing is, I mean, it was to train people to use pikes took longer than to train someone to use a musket. Mm -hmm. And it was considered a more um, gentlemanly weapon. There are, there are, you know, the gentleman of pike was, a, was an address that was used right post-English Civil War. Whereas, you know, musketeers were regarded as, as basically cheats up until that time. The idea of using a musket, you could train someone in a couple of days to use a musket properly. But it yeah. would take weeks to get a pikeman together. Oh yeah, pikes are <laughs> infinitely more difficult to learn how to use. And at the time of warfare, musketeers needed pikes because the rate of fire was so slow. They needed somewhere safe to retreat from cavalry. And yeah. horses will not, you know, up until we stopped using the horse, pikes worked. Yeah. You know, we stop using the horse. Horses and pikes will become not useless. run into spikes. Horses will run <laughs> right up to spikes and stop suddenly and throw the person on their back into the spikes. Yeah, but they won't run into them. And what's a bayonet? Spike on a of, rifle. I'm out, I'm out of ammunition. I now need a spear. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is exactly so that. We still, it is a... And in fact, there were two occasions in the in Afghanistan where the command to fix bayonets came, went out. In fact, they still they still issue bayonets to every everyone. Bayonets because are still issued. They still train you to use them. Yeah, there are still bayonet runs. That they use on all army training courses you know so spears still relevant essentially mm -hmm. we don't like to talk about it because it's a bit savage and shit but <laughs> spears are still relevant yeah oh i had a i had a, an, in, an in depth look at the glock field knife all right 
and it's really weird. Um, How so? Um, it's not full tang, for one. Okay. Which is strange. If you've ever seen it, it's about six inch long blade, but quite thin. Mm -hmm. It's more like a dagger. It will do field charts, tasks, but for a six inch blade that you can't chop with, it's kind of weird. There's not, there's, it doesn't weigh a lot. It is a really nice piece of steel. Okay. You can get it with a saw back or without a saw back. And I had a good look at the saw back, and it's more a root cutter for digging trenches. Yeah. You know, when you're digging trenches in the woods, you need something that can yeah. saw through roots. It's kind of mm -hmm. for that rather than sawing anything because it's a big old wide saw. It's like a four mil back saw. So precision work is not for this knife. You can't saw with it. And I don't like sawing with something that's got a sharp blade on the back end of it. No. Because if you get it stuck in the thing that you're sawing and it pings back, you've got a blade coming at you with all your own muscle power. So I'm not really big yeah. on that. So you'd have to be well careful with it. But it's got a weird little um, compartment in the end. If you take off the butt cap, there's a little tube in the end. It's about an right. inch and a half long. I was watching a guy put fit a glass breaker. He basically put an adenized bolt into the end of the, of the um, little socket on the back. And the socket on yeah. the back is because the Austrian rangers use it as a bayonet. And there is a lug that fits ah. into it to fit to a Steyr AUG. Yeah. Or Steyr AUG. Steyr, yeah. Yeah, which is a cool looking gun and really reliable. Um, that's why the Australian armed forces use it. Mm -hmm. They didn't go for the AR-15 or the Lee Enfield or the SA-80 or anything like that. They went straight for the Steyr. And it, because it's a very, for, for a German gun, it's very under-engineered. There's, yeah. there's so, there's, you know, it's one of those no user serviceable parts inside almost. There's only a few bits to it. You can strip it in seconds. It's a really, it's a, it is a great gun. If, you, if you've got to fire a lot of bullets and you want all of them to come out the end of the gun... Yes, it's good. For that. It's it's a great gun, but it's the it's the bayonet for a Steyr, made by Glock. It's, that looks pretty good. I'm just looking at a picture of it. it looks pretty good. They're not very expensive. They're they're like thirty quid. Really? Um, you can get them at USMC. dot co. dot uk. It's one. Of, it's that place down in Portsmouth. Oh, the Peacock lights. Henny sells them. Yeah. How much does Henny's charge? Um, thirty thirty seven quid. I thought it might be a bit more. Henny's is really interesting. It's an interesting catalogue to look forward to, but there is a markup on almost everything they do. Yeah. Well, they run a shop, you see, as well, yeah. so there's going to be a markup on it. The showroom, I should say. Yeah, but so do USMC, and it's seven quid cheaper there. Mm. So, you know, check your sources. A lot of people like it. It's not full tang. And if you, yeah. I would say look at the um, look at the YouTube videos about it because it's a it's a dis it's kind of a distressingly short tang. I can see tough. there's um looks like there was a knife tests video about it. Yeah, it's pretty tough and the blade's very thick, but it's like a the tang is only two inches into a like a four in, four and a bit inch handle. Mm -hmm. So there's two inches of tang with a bolt securing it to the rest of the knife, and then there's an inch and inch or so gap, and then there's this little tube. But the little tube, if you can lever the butt cap off, which you need a screwdriver to do, you could put a few things in there. Like a couple of matches, or you know, a couple of useful bits and bobs. It's not very yeah. big, but it is a you know, it's a thing to think about, and it has an extremely positive lock on the scabbard, and the scabbard mm -hmm. is the same polymer that the handle's made from, and okay. it's not plastic. It's the same polymer that Glock used for their handguns. Oh, really? So it 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 looks like more alike with that kind of thermoplastic handle, yeah, yeah. but it isn't. It's a re it's really really tough. Wow. So I'll check that out. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, I don't like buying knives to destruction test them. Mm -hmm. and I've seen people try, you know, do their best to break them, but because the polymer flexes and the tang is so short, mm -hmm. you can't really snap the knife. You can't really snap it on the handle end. Yeah. And you can't really snap the blade out of the thing. I, I suppose you could eventually, 10 years of battening it, but again, I'm not a big on battening. <laughs> Yeah, it's no, a so. knife to open shit up and to, to, you know, it is a combat knife, so, you know, questionable as if, if somebody found you camping in this country, whether they'd be yeah. happy or not to find it. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're in a bushcraft scenario, then you've got a reason for having it. Yeah. You know, the whole, you know, you, you have a reason for having it, therefore, you know, it, it can't be taken off you if you're, you know, you're camping or you're using it to do stuff. It'd be exactly. like arresting you for having a kitchen knife if you were camping. 
<laughs> yeah. What have you got that for? Well, cutting food, dickhead. So it's that. It's that whole knife thing. You know, if you have it in your pocket when you're walking around in a station or an airport, people are going to get quite justly pissed off with you. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you're going to a bushcrafting thing and it's in your pack, you know, it's a bit like arresting a chef on his way home from work. Yeah. You know, so, which is the key thing in the UK for bushcraft. People freak out about, you know, all this sort of like, oh, I, I'm worried about carrying this when I go to a bushcrafting thing. Well, if you're in a car, no no problem. If you're in, you know, your own, if, you, if it's in your pack and you're going camping, you know, again, it's the same problem for the police. Uh, most, I mean, most knife crime things are, and uh, are additional charges. Like when they really want to exactly. try a book of you, and in possession of an offensive weapon. If you get into a fight, and some, and you were in the wrong, and you had a knife in your pocket, you can, you know, you, you'll get into a lot of trouble. If you're going camping, and you've got a pack full of stuff, you know, then, uh, you know, they're not going to give you too much hassle. Generally, they're not going to give you too much hassle as well if it's hard to get to. Yeah, if you can't if you know, pull it's it. Like, if your knife's like um, almost at the bottom of your pack, that's what I would really say. You know, to get if to. you're on your way somewhere, put the knife at the bottom of your pack in another bag. Yeah, you know, make it like a. Well, what if somebody mugged you? Well, if they were going to give me ten minutes to rifle through my pack, take everything out, <laughs> open the bag, get the knife out, and then say, "Right, where were we?" Yeah. <laughs> You know. That's not going to happen. <laughs> what I what I do recommend though is those um, collapsible walking poles, either on the outside of the pack or extended, what simply to help you walking. Yeah, because those are fucking scary looking things. Yeah, no one's going to really give you a load of shit if you've got one of those. And I tell you what, you... the psychological effect of big stick is really yeah. amazing to watch. If you do do, if you are going to go wild camping and you're using public transport, take big stick mm -hmm. and watch how people react. People get out the fuck out of your way if you've got a big stick. And if it's a, like obviously a hiking pole and you're wearing a rucksack and you look like you're going hiking, nobody will bat an eye, but people will get out of your way. Yeah. A and your arm. Big stick. Trump's knife. Mm -hmm. Every time. Anyway. Sorry. I thought you didn't say you didn't use a gun last time. I didn't. What did you use? It's a a big, big stick. stick. Yes. <laughs> big stick is always working. And those walking poles have got some really nice little spikes on them. Oh yeah. So you have For, a thrusting um, and a, and a smacking weapon, pushing us to the mud. Yeah. But yeah. Right. Should we do news? Yeah, we should do news <laughs> after the little mini discussion. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's just like we, you know, it's it's, it's like proper rangerness there going on. Anyway. Yeah. Right. Okay. Do you want to do the first news story? Yeah, I'll do the first one. Oh, okay. Okay, so this is from Kevin. Thanks, Kev. Um, man jailed for refusing to decrypt hard drives. Uh, Francis Rawls, a former Philadelphia police sergeant, has been in Philadelphia Federal Detention Center for more than 16 months. His crime? The fire police officer has been found in contempt of court for refusing a judge's order to unlock two hard drives the authorities believe contain child pornography. Theoretically, Rawls can remain in jail indefinitely until he complies. The federal court system appears to be in no hurry to resolve an unresolved legal issue. Does the Fifth Amendment protect the public from being forced to decrypt their digital belongings? Until this is answered, Rawls is likely to continue to languish behind bars. A federal court appeals court sorry, heard oral arguments about Rawls' plight last September. So far, there's been no response from the U.S. Third Circuit Court of Appeals based in Philadelphia. Rolls was thrown into the slammer on September 30th, 2015, until such, quote, until such time that he fully complies, end quote, uh, with a court order to unlock his hard drives. Child porn investigation focused on Rolls when prosecutors were monitoring the online network Freenet. Uh, they executed a search warrant in 2015 at Rolls' home. The artist said it was a foregone conclusion that illicit porn is on the drives, but they cannot know for sure unless Rolls hands them the alleged evidence that is encrypted with Apple's standard file vault software. Yeah, um, it does go on and on and on. Yeah, but it does go on. I was going to say that 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 kind of sounds like he could just plead the fifth. Yeah, and not be. The, I'm sure the Fifth Amendment should be protecting him on that. 
the yeah. right to not incriminate oneself. Yeah. Um, it is interesting. Um, obviously, you know, if that person is trafficking child pornography, you want them behind bars. Exactly. Um, however, do you remember years and years and years ago when we were talking about how people would be, get got in the digital age is that child pornography would end up on their hard drives? I remember. Yeah. That was like that that was the big demon. It would be either terrorism or child pornography. Now mm -hmm. this is interesting in that if they had access to the network and were watching data package packets go to that machine, um, which they're making out that they do. Yep. You know, they are pretty much saying we know there's child pornography on that, then that produced evidence should be enough. Mm-hmm. The worrying it thing is, is that it would be very easy to put a very tiny computer on someone's network and have and it receive incoming it. packets and inject it with child pornography and yep. get that machine to remotely request it. Mm -hmm. um, so it could be a setup. I'm not saying that it is. I'm just saying without uh, this whole idea of digital proof is problematic because it can be got round and it can be faked. Yeah, quite easily. And also, like you said, the Fifth Amendment says that you, you have the right not to incriminate yourself. I'm so, pretty sure that's what it says. It pretty is. It's, you can remain silent. I mean, this is, you know, it was added in at a time when computers didn't exist. But you, if somebody asks you a, a leading question, you can remain silent so as not to incriminate yourself. You know, mm -hmm. forcing the accuser to prove that such a thing, you know, the thing that you're accused of has taken place. Rather than Pro trying to trick you into, you know, to say to incriminating yourself, protects a person from being compelled to be a witness against themselves in a criminal case. Yeah, which by handing over those codes, that kind of is. Yeah. Um. So the idea, you know, this is a, a very important thing. You know, we need to know one way or the other whether, you know, I mean, this is American law, obviously, but mm -hmm. it's it, you know, the ramifications would go internationally people would have to think about it um yeah so it, you've, you've got a you know but it's it, it it's interesting that if you go back to the 1980s blake seven yeah um, blake is accused of uh, uh there is digital evidence of, of the leader of the resistance who becomes the leader of the resistance um being guilty of child assault according to electronic records mm -hmm. that's what he's convicted of to get him out of the way now if you have to open up and hand over to, to digital forensics everything on your hard drive you know if that becomes a thing you know mm -hmm. what happens you know the next stage is what if it's on your cloud yeah. if you use cloud computing do you really have any control over what's in that cloud storage now, obviously, the companies that provide you with cloud storage have got a, like a, a real um, incentive to make sure that your data is safe and it's secure and it, you know, it doesn't get lost. But how hard is it to put something in someone's cloud storage? Yep. I mean, oh, here we go. If you've got remote access to their computer, which people give up, I mean, Windows 10 more or less hands out remote access as soon as you ping their IP address. Mm. Here we go. There's a thing actually later on in this. Um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation uh, essentially told the court, quote, the Fifth Amendment provides an absolute privilege against such self incriminating compelled decryption. Yeah. But, I mean, we're already seeing cases of people um, having to hand over their phone password when they go across borders. If you visit yeah. America, oh, they, they yeah, sort of like, America. they check some of your thing. I mean, I won't, I, I wouldn't, I would buy a phone. I'd buy another smartphone with nothing on it to go if I well, was going to go through the TSA screening. There's there's an easy way of, do, of doing that as well. You just if you just delete everything, yeah. You don't even need a new phone. You know, you yeah, delete just reset the, it to factory settings and yeah, and that's it. You go through. You don't need to have. You can just you can go. You can delete all your social media stuff off your phone, and you know keep it in the keep it in some sort of storage. And then as soon as you get past TSA, put it back on the phone. 
you know, like you've got the ability nowadays to ha- install applica- to actually back up applications onto USB devices or mm. put in like an SD card so yeah. that you can just offload it onto a storage, go through and then load it back on. Yeah. Oh, USB on the go is so good. It is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, technical people. Well, it's, I, t- I tell you, seriously, I mean, that USB on the go is like totally making my little Tesco Huddle tablet so useful Yeah. for filming. It's just ridiculous. Anyway, yeah, so I, 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 I want people that abuse children and people that, you know, make, make the abuse of children profitable behind bars. Absolutely. I worry mm-hmm. about this sort of thing. You know, I worry about, you know, this sort of like, you know, we, you know, we will, you know, there's a bit in uh, A Man for All Seasons, which is a very, one, one of the best movies of all time, about Thomas <laughs> Moore. And uh, Thomas Moore was a dick, has to be said. He was a Catholic that supervised the burning and torture of lots of people. However, there's this one bit where um, a friend of his betrays him in order to make the king happy. And, he, and mm-hmm. he goes, well, it's just a little law, you know, the idea that Henry VIII couldn't get divorced. He couldn't provide a, a, a church-backed way for Henry VIII to get divorced again. Yeah. And he, and he says to this guy, who later becomes Richard of Wales, he goes, and when you've torn down every law in the land to get to the devil, and he turns on you finally, what will you hide behind? Yep. If you... Destroy all the law in the land to get to the bad guys, then there's no protection for the good people. No, there isn't. In case the person that comes after you and utilizes all those removed laws or the gaps in the law to prosecute someone they don't like will put a lot of good people in jail. So the, these things are very important. I'm surprised it t- it's taken 16 months. Yeah. You know, if it, this is a landmark case, this is a kind of like we need to. You know, I don't know what an amendment to an amendment would be. You either need to amend it so that it is just a thing; it's the law. Mm-hmm. You know, I find it interesting that just Apple's standard encryption is, you know, evading everything that forensic computer um, technicians can throw at it. Oh yeah. You know, it's uh, you know, I don't like saying that anything by Apple's good because I think their stuff is locked in and not very hacker friendly. But that's quite impressive that Apple's own standard encryption, like the iPhone case earlier last year, mm. you know, that their basic encryption, the stuff that comes with the operating system, is so powerful that people can't get through it. Well, it's, it's how it is nowadays. Any so, the so, the encryption that we've got that people can just have by default yeah. on any computer, doesn't matter what operating system you're running, any device that's got the encryption available, it's strong enough to prevent anyone yeah, from getting without, into it without access to a supercomputer. Yeah, that's why they were all asking for like backdoor keys to be put into it. Yeah. Which thankfully there aren't. Well, we don't. We believe there aren't any. Thankfully. Yeah. Is there any Linux encryption software? Oh yeah, yeah. There's quite a few. You see, it encrypts some stuff by default, obviously, but um, you can put encrypted volumes on using. Oh, that's going to bug me until I remember now. Right. Yeah, I've, I've not got any basic encryption software on my Ubuntu as standard that I can find. What is it called now? Disk encryption. I've used it before and I can't remember what it's called. Because um, you can make encrypted drives and available methods oh cryptofs that was it cryptofs and um which was an offshoot of true crypt right and there's uh, some other versions now i mean it was a few years ago when i last did it but yeah mm. now there's um quite easy to encrypt disks on Linux. No, no. I should have to have, we should have to have a look into that. Not that I've got anything that necessarily needs encrypting. I don't think there's anything on here that I would want to encrypt, but it's a, it's a skill to learn. 
Oh yeah, easily. Like, if you don't, if you don't have things encrypted, then you probably should, uh, you know, look into it. And I, mm-hmm. I do, we, I, I do think that you know, think using things like Signal and uh, you know the easy encryption stuff. I'd like to get sort of like start doing that, and just just to practice it, so that if it ever becomes necessary, you've got that skill to hand. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Sorry, that, it's just that, that <laughs> I put that in there because it was an interesting test case. The idea that pretty much mo- most modern standard one two eight or two five six bit encryption is beyond the capacity of most law enforcement agencies. Yeah, to break. But this, the you know, this is kind of like a hanging in the air. If America were to say, right, okay, yeah, fair enough, encryption is thing, then if there's a UK test case or a European test case, then. Uh, that would that would also be interesting. Anyway, apologise for my voice at the moment, or if I sound like I'm breathing heavily. I've got a bit of a cold today. Okay, um, moving on. In child marriage news, um, again, this is an American story, but it is interesting. I, I, if anybody out there finds a UK set of statistics, that would be interesting. I'd like to know about that. The non-profit Unchained at Last analysed US marriage licence data from 2000 to 2010, and learned that 167,000 children, almost as all girls, some as young as 12, in 38 states were married off to older men. 31% of the girls were married to men who were 21 years or older. Extrapolating from their data set, Unchained at last estimates the true total mark. I hate it when people extrapolate from their data set, which means that <laughs> we, we, we did some math, but this isn't, you know. They're saying that um, estimates the true total child marriage of 2000 to 2010 there's 248,000 people under 18. Now, this is the interesting bit, because it, when you think of child marriage, you think of Africa, Asia, places like that. Mm-hmm. The marriages run counter to US foreign policy, which seeks to reform or punish US trading partners and aid recipients where child marriage is practiced. Domestically, child marriage persists because of fear that such measures might unlawfully stifle religious freedom or because they cling to the notion that marriage is the best solution for teen pregnancy. <laughs> That's some chilling shit right there. That is chilling. What they mean is unmarried teen pregnancy. So it's teen yeah. pregnancy without the approval of your imaginary friend. <laughs> Child marriage is correlated with a host of bad outcomes. Girls who marry when they're not yet 19 are 50% as likely to complete high school and 25% as likely to graduate from college, a 31% more likely to die in poverty, face a 23% higher risk of heart attack, diabetes, or cancer and stroke, and experience higher than average mental health problems. And women who marriage before the 18, age of 18 are three times as likely to experience domestic violence. Now, when you consider that the domestic violence figures in the Western world are pretty high anyway. Yeah. You basically triple your chance of domestic violence. Um, and here, this is directly from them. Many of the children married between, well, married, sorry, directly because of uh, Unchained at Last. Many of the children married between 2000 and 2010 were wed to adults significantly older than they were, the data shows. At least 31% were married to a spouse age 30, 21, or, 21 or older. The actual number is probably higher as some states did not provide spousal ages. Some children were married at an age or with a spousal age difference that constitutes statutory rape under the state's laws. In Idaho, for example, someone 18 or older who has sex with children under 16 can be charged with a felony, felony and imprisoned up to 25 years. Yet data from Idaho, which said the highest rate of child marriage of the states that provided the data, shows that some 55 girls under 16 were married to men 18 or older between 2000 and 2010. Holy shit. Yeah. So many of the states that provided data included categories such as 14 and younger without specifying how much younger some bride and grooms were. Thus the 12 year olds we found in Alaska, Louisiana, South Carolina. The data might not have been the youngest children wed in America between 2000 and 2010. Also the data we collected did not account for children wed in religious only ceremonies or taken overseas to be married situations that we at the Unchained often see. Most states did not provide identifying information about the children, but Unchained has seen child marriage in nearly every American culture and religion, including Christian, Jewish, Muslim, and secular communities. We have seen it in families who have been in America for generations and immigrant families from all over the world. In my experience, parents who marry off their minor children often are motivated by cultural or religious tradition, a desire to control their child's behaviour or sexuality, money, either a bride price or a dowry, or immigration related reasons, for instance when a child sponsors a foreign spouse. And of course many minors marry of their own volition, even though in most realms of life our laws do not allow children to make such high stakes adult decisions, or sign a contract, or get a credit card, or vote. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that's fucked up. But yeah, that it's, is kind of it's fucked mostly up. religion. Yeah, you know, I, I I shocked the shit out of some people at work the other night by saying that you shouldn't be allowed to be exposed to religion until you're 18, and that one law would would kill religion dead in a generation. It would. Imagine being 18 told about religion, any religion, any organised religion you care to name. There's an invisible person up in the sky that wants to control who we fuck, what we eat, and what we do on certain days. Mm-hmm. About what? Imagine trying to get that across to a, an educated 18-year-old anywhere in the world. They would yeah. tell you to fuck off. They really would. You would get shown the door in anybody's house if you tried to explain that as, as if it was a new idea. But we're, you know, we're born into this religion thing. And it's a control mechanism. Mm -hmm. It's literally to control. That's that's all it is. It might have started off as a kind of, this will be a good good way to tell people how to stay alive for longer. And this will give very, very poor people a reason to carry on serving wealthy people. Yep. Because if you're poor and somebody says, oh yeah, um, some people got born to rich parents and they're going to be telling you what to do for the rest of your life. And then you'll die and it'll all go black and that'll be it. Poor people wouldn't stand for it for a heartbeat. No. The only way you repress huge sections of the world is by try is by black by brainwashing them from birth that there's that there there is this place that you'll go to after you die. If you take that away, if you take the the end of your life reward for doing what you're told and knowing your place, poor people would be lynching. You know, if you basically could get people to not believe for a day. Wealthy people will be hanging from lampposts in every street. <laughs> yeah, pretty you know, much. People would be looking at pianos and thinking, "There's another use for the wire in that." <laughs> that would that would chaos would ensue. It would it really would. You know, I'm 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 quite happy to be wrong, and if I ever meet, say for example, Jesus, this is a guy that said everybody is is wonderful and we should be nice to everybody. And they haven't managed to write that out of the Bible. The actual shit Jesus said, you know, like the person who the religion is based on, yep. wouldn't fill two sides of A4. The actual stuff that's attributed to Jesus. No. Okay. And all that is about being nice to everybody, which you can sell out on. You can sell that to anyone. Yeah. This this poor dude decided that he would try and tell people to be nice to each other two thousand years ago. And uh, yeah, and if we are nice to each other, we all go to heaven. Wouldn't it just be really cool if we weren't massive jerks to each other? Yeah, the world would be a really good place to live in. However, wealthy and powerful people do not believe in religion. No. Wealthy and powerful people believe in making themselves and their families more wealthy and more powerful. Okay, and that's you can that's that's a constant in human behavior mm -hmm. wealthy and power people powerful people want their children to also be wealthy and powerful and they will do anything sell any lie make up anything to make sure that happens because our prerogative as humans is to look after our young that's it so when a wealthy and powerful person i don't know say like the head of a church who has managed to, you know, a church that has managed to invent a whole nother job description for themselves and their friends mm -hmm. that involves sitting around and telling people what to do for no good reason. You know, 6,000 years ago and more, a group of people figured out a way to get a job that didn't involve heavy lifting. And that's it. That's all it is. That really is all it is. And, and, to be fair, those that religious choice, that that creation of religion, basically meant that writing came about. So writing comes out of religion. In fact, if you look at all ancient writings, all of it's to do with what God wants. Yeah. All of it. Every last fucking thing. Any ancient runes that you find, anything inscribed into stone that survived it or written onto papyrus or preserved is nearly all religious. Very. It's not until the Greeks turn up that people start writing about shit that's other than religion. And then the Romans who wrote about everything. Mm -hmm. Most of the most of the Roman writing you find on lead tablets and shit like that, their own notebooks is all about I could do with some more socks. England is a horrible place to live. 
<laughs> yeah. That's a good 60% of all Roman writings that I hate it here. You know, Roman soldiers posted to Hadrian's wall and shit. Yep. Uh, uh, you know, and up until... Uh, but then, you know, the Romans couldn't hold Europe with military might. And they said, what we need is a religion that we can sell to anybody. And so if we start off with be nice to each other, which everybody can get along with, because you have to be, if you're struggling to survive against the elements and farming and looking after animals, and a winter could kill your entire family, and any disease that comes along can wipe you out, and you say, mm -hmm. no matter how bad it is, it will be all awesome in heaven. Now, rather sensibly, Christianity, unique in religion, doesn't describe heaven. Most other religions no. try to. But the Romans were really, really clever in that they descri they don't describe heaven so that it can change along with the time. Because people's expectation of the heaven can change from generation to generation. Yep. So that means you sell this nebulous idea of everything being groovy when you die. So that means you can keep poor people where they are. Because when they die, if they've been good poor people, they'll go to heaven just like the, the wealthy people. And that's it. That's That's literally all it is. If you unplug that, and you made like this could be your last day it could all go black if you get knocked down by a car let's try and make mm -hmm. the world a better place people would get on board with making the world a better place it's there was a, a good a good uh, lecture given uh, about why i choose not to believe not me personally but it was called why i choose not to believe yeah you know but the idea that everything's going to be all right in the end and that other people will make it perfect at some point at some point within at the end of your life on earth you'll go to this wonderful heaven place and everything will be ruby means that people yeah. don't try and fix the shit that's broken here mm -hmm. and why need, why, why they feel they? that you know they sort of like they can tell people that if you are a good christian or a good muslim or a good jew or you know a good buddhist that everything will be fine and that means that the entire planet doesn't try and fix what's broken and what's broken oh, it's, it's a they're... trial yeah it's a test your you suffering see, is just it's like well that suffering is like... just if there is a god, then God's being a bit of a dick. Yeah. So, you know, it just pisses me off. And this child marriage, you're marrying, you know, children as young as 12. Yeah. Children whose bodies aren't even fully formed yet are being married into, you know, uh, you know, this is the shit, you know, and, you know, this is not, you know, this is, you know, they're generally religious. That's not okay. Believe what you want, but just fuck off and believe it. Off you go. No, don't, yeah, don't have don't. to organise everybody else's fucking life. Yeah. You can tell people that that's what you believe, but in a secular society where people just believe whatever they want, um, you know, that doesn't involve, you know, child prostitution. Yeah. I think you'll find. You know, children... those, those parents want the best for their children, ideally. Mm -hmm. But yeah. their idea of the best for their children is skewed by a priest or religious person telling them that for the good of their soul that you have to give up your child to be raped essentially yeah uh no because any sex without consent is rape mm -hmm. and a 12 year old can't consent to sex we've decided that the basically the civilized world has gone hmm you need to be at least you know reasonably considerate uh, you need to actually be able to consider someone to be an adult before you can have sex with them that's what exactly. adult means capable of reproducing yeah you know you might be you know, it might be a stupid person that's consenting to having sex but at least they've chosen to it's not yeah. being, they're not being made to do this and you know it's just as just as likely in christian sex as it is in any other sex but americans pretend that it's a barbarous thing that happens overseas and it's not well, it 248,000 underage weddings yeah 248,000 a quarter of a million so that's that's just too significant one is too many <laughs> a quarter of a yeah. million way yeah, way too much anyway i'll stop ranting now but yeah should we go on to the uh, next one yeah cool uh, okay so the government's uh, national cyber security center based in victoria london has officially been opened by the queen uh, headed up by gchq's uh, kieran martin who has moved from the agency's headquarters in Cheltenham to the NSC, uh, NCSC has already handled 108, 188 high-level cyber attacks against the UK over the past three months, 
Quote, the cyber attacks we are seeing are increasing their frequency, their severity, and their sophistication, end quote. Chancellor Philip Hammond said ahead of the opening. GTHQ will act as a parent body to the NCSC, but the new organization hopes to be more open about its work uh, to help businesses across the UK present themse- protect themselves from hackers. While the Senate officially opened today, it has been operating since October 2016. Uh, quote, we will help secure our critical services, lead the response to most serious incidents, and improve the underlying security of the internet through technological 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 improvements yeah. and adv- through uh, yeah, and advice to citizens and organisations. End quote, Martin said. I wish you'd uh, said technological. Include- technological, yeah. I really wish you'd said that. That would have been <laughs> oh, lovely. No, it would have been brilliant. nuclear. <laughs> Nuclear. <laughs> <laughs> this will include finding vulnerabilities in the public sector websites, stopping spoof emails, and taking down thousands of phishing websites in the UK. Uh, it was set up in, by the previous Chancellor, George Osborne. In November 2015, the ex minister announced $1.9 billion will be made available for tackling cybercrime by 2020. Included in this budget is an undisclosed amount of money for helping slow cyber attacks against terrorists in other countries. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's it's this kind of like um, uh, I get that you know you have to protect the infrastructure from people that are going to dick around with it. Fair yeah. enough. I get that businesses are at risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just and uh, you know yes the. You, you need a bunch of people. It's just that, like, this is, again, this is too close to the stopping terrorism. Yeah. Why not just say stopping companies and us from losing patient records? Or being, exactly. being, being held to, you know, cybercrime, fair enough. You don't want people stealing money out of your bank account. You don't want people, your medical records to go flying all over the place. You don't want to get an email one day saying, oh, uh, all your medical records are, are accessible by me. You know, I'm, I'm finding people and, and saying we're going to publish it on Facebook if you don't give me, you know, two thousand pounds or some shit like that. Yeah. But they've always got to bring in the whole terrorism thing. Yeah. You know. And you I know, think... so like when you when you keep going cybercrime terrorism and you put those things together, you get situations where that autistic guy was accused of terrorism, the who broke into, you know, the yeah. Pentagon looking for UFO files. Yeah. It clearly wasn't. It was just a cyber crime. But they made out that it was terrorism. You know, this is a, because... an autistic kid in his in his bedroom in his mum and dad's house. Yeah. You know, if he can get into it, then you need to either give him a job or ask him how he did it and then block up that hole. He's autistic. You could have just asked, how did you get in? Well, I did this, this, and this. Okay, block the hole. Yeah. The hole is only there because, pe- you know, the managers, the, you know, the upper echelon of management. It's the it was too expensive no, to No, they just uh, want to work from home. That's oh, why this okay. shit, that's why this shit is open. I when when I worked for an IT company, one of our com- uh, one of our um one of our clients was the British Nuclear Fuels. Mm-hmm. And and it was like, oh yeah, if there's a cyber incursion, you have to call the British Nuclear Police. It was like, how would there be a cyber incursion? Well, a lot of our management like to work from home. <laughs> so there are holes in the network. If it's a nuclear power station, it doesn't connect to the internet. Don't connect it, it to the internet. It can go bang and kill everybody. <laughs> Why are the control systems linked to the internet? Well, because someone someone important wants to not come in if there's a problem. Fuck them. Pay yeah, them more. Come in. Get in. If you don't want to yeah. come in if we've got a problem, you're the wrong guy for this frigging job. It's exactly. a nuclear power station. You know, it's the Pentagon. Don't connect it to the internet. If it's important, like nuclear launch codes, don't connect it to the internet. Just don't. Yeah. Rule one. No. This. Have a completely separate network that connects to the internet that you're aware is going to go down and fuck up from time to time. But no. Yeah. Not on the internet. You're the military. You're, you know, you're very wealthy. Have a hard line. If you've got a... (laughs) connect to it from somewhere else but not the internet that's fucking stupid it's just because DARPA are kind of like we invented the internet well tough you're idiots you let it escape 
It's out there. Yeah. Yeah, you'll have to invent some other shit. Yeah, you'll have to invent your own another little thing to go along with it. Or put, you know, just understand that everything's going to take a little longer because it's got to be secure. Put 256 or, you know, 512 bit encryption. Well, it'll take me 30 seconds to open a document. Well, yeah, because it's important. Yeah. You've got time for important. Oh, but no, we have to have this. And hacking equals terrorism. Mm-hmm. It's like, give those people jobs. If some kid in Bahrain hacks into your, into your defense network and starts tinkering around with your satellites, you need to employ that person because they're going to be well useful. Yeah. If you've got to fight a war on cyber on cybernetic terms, you know, give those people jobs. You know, put them in little rooms and give them all the computer hardware they want to play with, and let them have access to everything. Fuck it, I'd want them. It's exactly what it should be. You should just give them give them jobs. Yeah. You know, your military should scare the shit out of you. You know, do it. You know, but yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, cybercrime, yes, but it's, that, it's always got to be cybercrime and terrorism. Yeah. Cybercrime terrorism. When somebody, that, you know, somebody that's not smart enough to realise that their fate does not lay in, lay in the hands of their invis- invisible friend has probably not got a computer degree. Has probably not got the mouse to just go, hmm. You never, you never see, you know, it's just not something you see. It's just people are frightened of technology because they don't understand it. It's amazing. Anyway, yeah. okay. Uh, is it me? Uh, this one too. Yes. In big business, getting screwed over. Um, Argos to pay two point four million pounds to three thousand thirty-seven thousand workers paid less than the minimum wage. The retailer nice. has been fined one point five million by HMRC after asking staff to undergo briefings and security checks outside paid working hours. Yeah, uh-huh. if you want to tell someone something to do with work, you're paying for their time. Well, yeah, clearly. So Argos is being forced to pay 2.4 million in back wages to more than 37,000 current and former shop workers, and has been fined nearly another 1.5 million pounds after an investigation. The catalogue and online retailer, which was bought by Sainsbury's last year, wrote to staff on Thursday after it was being found to be paid less than the minimum wage to workers because it was asking them to attend staff briefings and carry out security checks outside the working hours for which they were paid. However, Ar- Argos will only pay the tax authority eight hundred thousand pounds because it's been awarded a discount on f- um, on the fine for agreeing to pay up within fourteen days. <sighs> yeah, oh, I wouldn't have let that slide. So, underpayments of, a, of an average of sixty four pounds per person date back to twenty fourteen and were first uncovered last year ahead of Argos's takeover by Sainsbury's. The supermarket said it changed processes as quickly as possible last December after being made aware of the issue and will be repaying staff at the end of this month. The underpayment affects 12,000 current employees and more than 25,000 former staff. The number of workers underpaid by Argos is well in excess of those shortchanged by Debenhams, which on Wednesday became the most prolific offender to be named and shamed by the government under a system that came into force in 2013. The department saw Chambers fined £63,000 and forced to pay back nearly £135,000 to 12,000 workers. The company said it had underpaid staff by an average of £10 each in 2015 because of a technical error in its payroll calculation. Uh-huh. Yeah. Argos' underpayment is also well ahead of the £1 million awarded in back pay to Sports Direct workers after an HMLC investigation last year. About 250 pe- people directly employed by Mike Ashley's retail group and about 3,000 staff hired through temporary employment agency were to- found to have been paid less than the million wage over four years. Argos is expected to be named and shamed by the government later this year. Well, faster than the government then. In a letter to (laughs) staff, John Rogers, who became the chief executive of Argos after it was acquired by Sainsbury's last September, said the issue had been uncovered by HMSC as part of a routine visit. (gasps) Yeah. So it's like, it's just not on. It's just this assumption that, you know, you're lucky to have a job. I mean, minimum wage, you can't live on minimum wage anyway. You can't live on your own in a in even the cheapest flat on your own on minimum no. wage. It's really tough. It's very difficult. And in fact, minimum wage works out about, if you're working 40 hours, about after tax, about £850 a month. Yep. And if you went, if you went on the dole, you'd probably, you, and you were getting housing benefit and your... Um, council tax paid and certain other things paid for you it actually works out as about 20 quid a week extra mm-hmm. so you're bit, so you over, over dole if you could get it all organised 
you're working for 50p an hour. Yeah. Minimum wage. And that's... I'm not saying you should rely on Dole, but I mean, that's the reality of it. It's, you know... Do you, do you, would you want to work for 50p an hour? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So that's that's the situation. Minimum wage is, is shit, basically. That's why we need this basic citizen's income. Oh, yeah, definitely. That it's needs just to needed. happen. So that if you are suddenly unemployed, you're like, okay, well, I can do part-time work and still survive. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, over to you. Next one. Just uh, a second. I think it's the last story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Irish women call for a nationwide strike if they don't get a referendum on the country's brutal abortion ban. Ireland's abortion laws are among the most barbaric in the world. Among its deficits, it forces women to carry an unviable fetus-assisted term, making them labour to deliver babies who live short hours in extreme pain before dying before them. The ban also provides 14, for 14-year 14 prison sentences for women who import pharmaceuticals used to induce abortion. An, quote, ad hoc non-affiliated group of activists, academics, artists and trade unionists, end quote, calling itself Strike for Appeal, are set to march on the 8th International Women's Day, also the Day Without Woman protests in America, if the government doesn't call for a referendum on the abortion law before then. They'll be repeating the tactic that Polish women use to defeat their own country's cruel abortion ban, though it keeps resurfacing. The Polish and Irish abortion laws are similarly overbroad and share similar, a similar origin. Conservative Catholic lobbyists with church backing who use, faith's enormous cash, uh, who use the faith's enormous cash reserves to forge alliances with misogynist elements in the far-right movement to craft these anti-women policies. Again, my invisible friend wants to control you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Fucking um, hell. Yeah. So, um, if you can, on March the 8th, anybody listening to this, it'd be nice if you took the day off work and explained why. And, uh, well, I mean, this is obviously aimed at women, but I think, you know, it, it's important. You know, uh, because it just blows me away the idea that you know the state can control someone's reproductive ability well, this is what we're talking about yeah. yeah and it's no no it fucks up lives it it really does and for no reason other than to control people and keep people that are already poor poor mm -hmm. you know seriously you know wealthy people if say you're a wealthy woman that lives in Ireland and you discover you're pregnant and you don't want the baby. You just take a plane, go to England for a couple of months, come up with some excuse as to why you're going, have your abortion, and come back. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you're poor, you're stuck with a baby that you didn't want, or that could have been the, the product of rape or incest, that keeps you stuck in that rape and incest environment, because trying to bail out of a, of a household if you're pregnant or you're forced to have a child, really, it's impossible. And it's just controlling. It really I is. I can't it's... imagine what it would be like. I, I, I think, you know, at the very least, I would be organising a strike if I were in their position. I, I would probably be burning shit down. <laughs> but again, that's, that's a, that's, I'm not in that position. I'm not oppressed to this, the extent that I can't think of any way out of it. You know, I'm talking again from privilege. Mm -hmm. You know, because I'm a man. It was like, why well, this must be fought, and I am empowered by that privilege to go right. Fuck it, violence time. But you know, I am booking March the eighth off. I won't go to work on March the eighth, and when my employer asks me, it's like I am standing in solidarity, and you know, I will, I will happily tweet. I, I may well use the day just to go on social media and hound social media about it. <laughs> Sounds you know, like a good this plan, is dude. not okay. This is, you know, this is Ireland. It's over yeah. there. It's not far away. It's not like, it's just, you know, just some across the tiny little the country Irish in the middle of nowhere. These yeah. are, you know, these are, you know, civilized people doing this to other civilized people. It's not on in the name of an imaginary friend, but really, yeah. so they could make poor people stay poor. Because I think the thing about social media is, you know, I think the people that are, are wealthy and in charge kind of see that you know the ability to organize in a way they can't track or control 
is causing this thing where their their control over people and their control over the economy of the country is slipping. Mm, it really is. It's on. So their their request is that if you can take the day off work and not do any domestic chores, um, you can ask local businesses to close their services in support. You can wear black and register support on social media using the hashtag strike for repeal. And yeah, I think, you know, I would like everybody to do that because it's just barbaric. It really is. You know, I mean, it just, there is, you know, it's, I, I, I'm not, having an abortion is a really stressful thing. You know, I know, I know women that have had abortions and it, you know, was a very hard point in their lives. But even mm -hmm. that hard point, it would have been so much worse for them if they had had that child at that time in their lives. Yeah. You know, it's and it's just, I know my own mum had a terrible time having, you know, children when she could have, you know, literally done other things rather than have children. You know, and it's just absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. And the Catholic Church joining up with fascistic parts of government to control people, just so they can control people. The idea of anybody thinking, I'm, I've never met you, but I have, a, I have a burning desire to control your life and keep you in poverty. And it's just, no, not okay. No, I mean, that's a human rights violation. Yep. Flat out. You know, and if, you know, say Namibia had a similar level of human rights violation, if we didn't believe in the invisible friend, if we, as a state, say England becomes a secular state, which it isn't, and we as a secular no, state not. believe that the um, barring and, and criminalizing abortion for people that needed it and wanted it was a, a violation of human rights, we would cease trading with Namibia. We would. We'd go, I'm sorry, you're a bunch of wankers. Um, and we can't, at, short of invading, we can't make you do these things, you know, be nice people. But we can certainly choose not to buy your goods. Yeah. We can certainly um, make your goods illegal in our country. Uh, and it's Ireland. It's over there. And they're getting away with it. It's fucking wrong that they're getting away with it. To stop no. this. So, yeah. I mean, that's the problem. It's, it's the invisible friend and the, you know, those people, you know, those people do not believe in Jesus. No. The Catholic lobbyists do not believe it. They couldn't. There's no way that you could believe in Jesus and, like, you know, care for people and, and do that kind of draconian shit. Exactly. Jesus will be pissed. If Jesus turns up, he's going to be so angry at you people. That yeah. You're, 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 <laughs> and if he will slap you, and if you look at him surprised, we'll slap you again for being surprised. <laughs> Jesus be coming back, and he's, he's I, I, I recommend to Jesus to get some tactical, um, sort of like uh, carbon fiber brass knuckles, because you're going to be slapping <laughs> a lot of people, and your hands going to get tired. <laughs> There's, there, there, there's definitely some slap. This is what happened when you when you when you, you 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 leave Earth and you leave such a vague description of what people should do, and yep. then you then you say whatever laws you make up will will copy in heaven. Why did you do that, you idiot? You say if you're not nice to people, fuck it, you're going to hell. And that extends to everybody. If you're not nice to anybody, if you're mean to someone, that's it, you're fucked. You will get fucked up. Jesus needs to come back as Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah. You know. Say what again, I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> you, oh, know, class. You, you, you know, that's how I I like to imagine God as Morgan Freeman and Jesus as Samuel L. Jackson. Yeah. You know. God's gonna send in Jesus to kick ass and take names. Should it exist. I, that's how I want it to happen. I'm happy to be wrong. Jesus can sharp and go, I am real. I did fuck up and drop the ball. I handed the, the power to the wrong people. And I'll go, yes, you did. It was nice to see you. I decided not to believe in you because all the people that you said could believe in you turned out to be wankers. <laughs> it allowed them to be utter wankers to everybody else on the planet. There is yep. a continent on Earth that hasn't been affected by Christian people fucking it up. You have dropped the ball. What were you playing at? You need to pay more attention. I question your management leadership skills. 
You are not in charge. It's singing, we we need we need a, a like a team building weekend, but you need to correct some of this shit. We need to go down and play paintball somewhere or something, or, or do some <laughs> scrambling or kayaking or whatever the fuck it is you think we need to do. But seriously, some shit needs to be done because because shit's got way off course. Yep. You are, that's not that's shitty management. You need to put someone else in charge. You need someone with definite goals. The planet being a better place. You know, really. Time to show up is now. The planet will die if you don't fucking fix some things. <laughs> but you have allowed people to believe in an imaginary friend to such an extent um, that they're willing to believe rich and powerful people that don't have their interests in, in mind when they decide yeah. this shit. We need more poor people because if there are more poor, more people in a family and it wasn't born into wealth, they will be poorer. They will be poor. The more children you have to younger people, the poorer they are. That's just economic fact. Yep. If some person who's 21 has three kids, they are fucked financially. Unless they come from a wealthy family, and if they came from a wealthy family, they would have been using contraception, they would have, you know, not been so depressed that sex was the only outlet, you know, and all this sort yeah. of shit. You know, if the only thing that's fun that you can afford to do is sex, you will have more children. Mm-hmm. And it's just bollocks. It's just keeping poor people poor. For the benefit really is. of the church, which basically makes loads of money off those poor people thinking my life is shit. But when I die, I will go to heaven and everything will be okay. So I better give some money to these religious types. Yep. The fuck. And buy my way into heaven. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like it's a bit like the lottery and the X Factor. These are things dangled in front of poor, desperate people to say you too can be like us. Yep. Footballers, boxers, you know, people that will enter, you know, entertainers manage to claw their way out of work, the working class and are held up as the example to all the other poor people. And then wealthy people make out that poor people aren't trying. Well, if you're yeah. born into a family of 10 in a working class family, how the fuck are you going to progress? When, the, you know, the biggest worry every week is whether you're going to get fed. You're not going to go. I think the government needs to change, and we must we must turn up and, and, and use all our energies to completely oppose it. No, of course they haven't got time. But yeah, but yes, it's yeah. Uh, the strike for repeal, an ad hoc, non-affiliated group of activists, academics, artists, and trade unionists. I don't say working people. That's interesting. And the strike is endorsed by the abortion rights campaigns, Outhouse, the Anti-Racism Network, Sex Workers Alliance Ireland, and other feminist organisations. Yeah. And, oh. Hopefully, inclusive feminist organisations that don't ex exclude sex workers or trans people. That would be nice. Well, it's got the uh, Sex Workers Alliance, so I yeah. believe, yes. Yeah. I always I, I always have a better feeling about feminism when a trans or a sex workers group is is, is under the banner of something that's going to be achieved. Because, you know, I want the opposition yeah, there are some to, all, to all patriarchy and bollocks turfs. to be at least 50%, not the Pearls and, and Twinset Brigade. Yeah. You know, you need everybody. There are some rad femmes and turfs who don't really do the whole thing any yeah. help it needs. Yeah, it shit bothers me. But yeah, so it'd be nice if we could be as supportive as possible to that. Anyway, so that's right. the news. I managed to get out of it. I thought it was going to take a lot longer to get through the news than that. Um, um, so good. I'm going to stop the recording. And we're going to play some halftime music, which, again, I have dropped the ball a little bit. I did a load of extra work yesterday, so um, I will put in some music now, and uh, we'll come back with a discussion, which this week is on... Uh, what? How, how will we term this week's discussion? Ooh. In a way that makes people want to come back and listen to part two. <laughs> <laughs> What really is PC culture? Yeah. By which we mean political correctness, not computers. Yeah. Yeah, what what really is political correctness? I think we're having yeah, we're having a discussion about what is political correctness. Yeah. And how does it fit into today? What is it today? Yeah, so I think uh, there's uh yeah, that's a subject that I think we both we both have a similar viewpoint on, but there are points at which will there'll be a bit of give and take in this one. I, I think. I think there will be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, man. So uh, we'll be back in after these important uh, artistic messages.
castles only to the bars within So we pray Tension underlying the situation Resistance underneath the boot of power So we pray, pray, pray Cause we all fall down We all fall down Yes, we're back. There was and music we're back. And stuff. Uh, so thank you to everybody that's still listening at this point in the thing. And if you want to get involved, just email something into uh, v4v at earthling.net um, or get in the IRC at webchat.freenode.net or install Pigeon and go to the irc.freenode.net as the server and then hash rangers r4ng r5. Uh, just get involved. There's always someone in there. Um, although a lot of people are kind of logged in and they're not there, so you know, be a bit patient and people will sort of check back in if they're logged in and, and have a conversation. I had a really good chat with Misanthropic Gods the other night. Oh, yeah. He'd been, he'd been out backpacking at a really weird location that was kind of like woodland by the sea or by a lake, and it was all beaches and woods. Yeah. Uh, and, he's, and he sent over some of his thing. We get, well, do need to do some more Rangers TV soon. But life's been a bit hectic, and I've got a uh, training session with the BBC. Oh, nice. Well, See, that, um... I don't believe I've got a future career with the BBC. This is the one thing about that. And I don't yeah. know whether they'll let me present the news. Because mm -hmm. can you imagine me just going, hmm, I probably don't have a future with the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> so if something really is out of hand... I could actually say on BBC Radio that it, this shit is out of hand. <laughs> and they've got no, there's no delay. I found that out when no. I went and visited them. I said, well, what's the delay when somebody swears or kicks off? He goes, oh no, we try and prevent that never happening. And it's like, but if I'm in control of the production in the studio and I'm reading the news, uh, I could kick off completely. And that would just go live out on air. Yep. <laughs> oh dear. So I don't know whether to sabotage a future career with the BBC, which I don't think I have, in order to get something real out there. So oh, I, I, I will I, keep I, everybody posted. So if, if you know, get and try and get it recorded, and see if we can hook up an FM radio to a recorder. So if I um, and know when I'm going to be doing it, and then if it does kick off, we've got a backup. And we can go. Ah, we did this. We were bad and got thrown out of the BBC. <laughs> Yeah, I hope I bump into the same security guard that I had a, a, a thing with when I, when I went there the first time. Oh, yeah. That would be lovely. 
See, you did get to throw me out, but it wasn't for having anything that you didn't want me to have. <laughs> Got thrown out for much more legitimate reasons. But yeah, so uh, tomorrow night I'm going to their first training session. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. I shall report back. <laughs> Very cool. Be interesting to hear about that. Yeah. So yeah, it's a big old building down at Salford Keys. Mm. So the BBC, ITV and Channel 4 all have like giant offices there, the Media City in Salford. Yep. And it's right next to the Lowry Museum and uh, the Imperial War Museum North. Mm-hmm. So when you next come up, we could possibly take a wander out there because it's an interesting part of the world. It's like really, really high-tech Manchester. Oh, yeah, sure, definitely. Mm. Imperial War Museum North is a bit more grim than, uh, yeah. <laughs> than the one in Victoria in London. But so it could, mm. be a, could be an interesting visit. Yeah, no worries. Definitely, man. Yeah, so today's uh, conversation or discussion is is all about political correctness. Yeah. Which, as the Daily Mail likes to say, has gone mad. Political correctness has gone mad. Um, we're having to be polite to everybody. I think this is the thing that I, I want to... I think, first of all, we should give a bit of backstory to mm. what is or was, where, where the term political correctness came from. Yeah. Well, I'd say what eighties, eighties, eighties. Yeah, pretty sure eighties. In, in the eighties, yeah. And that's when homosexuals were invented. <laughs> <laughs> it was homosexuals suddenly became invented. They were suddenly there. appeared in the eighties, um, and not just Larry Grayson being a bit camp or, uh, or Dale Winton. Yeah, well, Dale Winton's quite eighties. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think up until the 80s, there were home... I mean, you know, um, Christopher Biggins played lukewarm in Porridge. Yeah. Uh, which And uh, Mr. Humphreys in Are You Being Served? It was... And it was moving away from A couple of the guys that. in Ain't Half Hot Mum. And those, those were the homosexuals that were allowed because they were funny. Yeah. It was moving away from that to people asking to be treated right. Yeah. And... What started off as... People being, uh, um, people using the correct, the, the requested terms to do, to talk to people, turned into politicians using language to obfuscate things, mm. and that's what political correctness started as. That's yes. why it was called political correctness, and it was looked down upon. Mm. And because I remember, I remember growing up, people saying, "Oh, they're being politically correct," and they weren't talking about people. They were talking about situations. They were talking about things to do with businesses yeah. um, that, that didn't that didn't impact people based on who they were. It was it was it there wasn't is, originally there is a bit used. of class war there as well because it was yeah. quite okay for wealthy or important people to be gay, um, but we didn't talk about it. So if you think, <laughs> say, Noel Coward, now I don't think anybody on earth could say that Noel Coward was a, was straight. Or Oscar yeah. Wilde. Uh, Oscar Wilde's mm -hmm. a bad example because Oscar Wilde was Irish and, and was persecuted. But Noel <clears> Coward, <throat> everybody sort of like didn't talk about it. Yeah, that famous bit game, where Winston talk Churchill was talking about the guards officer that being arrested for cottaging in Hyde Park. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that famous thing where he goes, uh, oh, say, oh, Mr. Churchill, I'm afraid one of our guards officers has been arrested um, for indecent exposure in Hyde Park with a, with a sailor. And he goes was bloody cold last night and they go, yes yes it was one of the coldest winters on record mr churchill and winston churchill went makes you proud to be british yeah <laughs> so the idea of a posh person being called in flagranto in a public place with another man was sort of okay because of you know boarding school yeah i mean you know you know wealthy people being gay wasn't an issue noel coward could be gay but if you weren't was noel coward if you were a minor not okay to be gay. You would be bullied yeah. mercifully and hounded out of whatever small working class town you would be on. So in it the eighties, when it came being... out, yeah, it was like if you're poor and gay, that's not okay. Yeah. And in the eighties, what happened is like more and more people, you know, things like we had women MPs because you couldn't not be political correct when the prime minister was a woman. You can't yeah. say a woman's place is in the home when the person with the nuclear launch codes is a woman. The person that can declare war on another country as a woman. So, the you know there was more traction for minorities, shall we say? And I hate that well, term. Well, I, I think because we should you know, we should clarify that we're, that 
we're using the modern what's understood today to be politically correct to describe yeah. this because uh, at the time it was used to describe um, politicians who were using words to dance around things to not yes. speak plainly about things it wasn't that they were using slurs yeah or it was that they were trying to hide what they were doing yeah by talking in a very roundabout obfuscating fashion that mm. was political correctness well there was um, also a certain amount of comedy around at the time like not the nine o'clock news and alas Smith mm-hmm. and jones where they were attacking say the um overwhelmingly male white police force yeah. you know and people you, you know in air quotes saying phrases like ethnic minorities and equality people mm-hmm. literally you could hear the air quotes when people said oh we, we've got to have some women in this job and we've got to have some you know people that aren't white men yeah. and when people said ethnic minorities instead of black or asian so those phrases start to appear in the early 80s mm-hmm. and of course you've got lots of musicians coming out as either gay or bisexual well i don't i don't think freddie mercury ever came out but all of a sudden you've got some very high profile people pushing back boundaries you've got things like stonewall and lots of like the terence higgins trust aids comes along and suddenly yeah. you know it's a life or death issue whether you talk about being gay or not and, and you know so mps are having to deal with this thing because until then lots of different minority groups shall we say or, or people that weren't in the mainstream were having to be to come out as you know as a result of things beyond any government control happening mm-hmm. and also lots of um feminist upsurgence because we had a woman prime minister so you couldn't then no, not say i mean the, the top job in the in the whole country was held by a woman yeah. so people were dancing around the fact that you know a lot of the most powerful organizations in the country were being run by straight white men yeah that was it they, they were they were using language to talk about things but at the same time not talk about them yeah and then so that they could deny later on that they talked about something yes it's like, oh no, that's not what I said. I said this, which they could pass off as meaning something else. But also, so that they couldn't get into trouble for having just a straight white male, you know, um, viewpoint on things. That as well, yeah. It's they were, so, they so were that, using it to so that you couldn't say say, well, so you're just talking about men. It was it was couched in such a way that they were talking about people. Yeah, you know, friend instead of like men and women, you've got you know citizens or the ever horrible consumer. Mm-hmm. You know, so people were referred to in non-gender ways, but not in a way to include everybody, but so that they couldn't be pulled up on it. So yeah, it was thinking a, of your career rather than the good of people. Yeah. So that's how it started out. And what we've seen in like the last decade or so is more courage from minorities, um, especially with the advent of social media. Mm. Um, people pushing back against the the underlying masculine narrative yeah. that says that cis white men are at the top. And, you know, we could de- I'll debate with anyone in regards to that, because it's cause, and I'll, I'll happily debate it because it's true, you know. <laughs> it's just, you just have to spend a little bit of time looking into it. You'll find that, yeah, it is uh, the patriarchy does actually exist, and it is pretty strong, and it is it gets into everything. Well, to the um, point where it's the assumption, it's the assumpted norm, the assumed yeah, that's, norm that's in, it. in almost all things. It's a straight white man you're talking about. And that is patriarchy, but that's that not even it. the majority. Yeah, if you take well, all so, the sorry, women involved, yeah. and then all the um, people that aren't straight white men that aren't women, the majority mm-hmm. of people aren't straight white men. No, oh, exactly. It's that's it's not a majority. It's a, you know, it's it's a just, minority. It's it's an assumption that that's who you're speaking to. Yeah. Um. I've I've definitely been guilty of it. You know, I've been because, guilty of it as well because I was a geek and there was just an assumption that geeks were all straight white men. Well, they, uh, um, yeah. Fortunately, I've been better educated since then. You know. You know. Mm-hmm. But 
you know, it's like my argument that I don't understand Gamergate is like there are girls that want to be geeky, and there are yeah. lots of them. Uh, hallelujah! How are you not? Yeah, how are you not? How how are you not? You're bouncing off the walls with the fact that you can actually, unless of course, and this is the thing that I think a lot of them seem to not be able to. They're not seem to be able to realize the irony of it. And this is a, a thing we're going to have it in the Recomedia. I read this article by. Um, can't remember his name now. I'll have to look up the sent the mail that I sent to you with that link. So there's an art, there's um, an opinion piece by Dale Baran, who's a maker of um, high quality. Well, he says high, high quality precision comics on DaleBaran.com. Wrote a <clears throat> an article slash opinion piece about his experiences with 4chan. From hmm. 4chan's exception, inception, from an offshoot of something awful, all the way up to now. And it basically it's a, it's a self reinforcing circle where they have a weird this weird sort of hyper masculinity persecution complex where it were coupled with nihilism. Where they um, believe that the the reason everything is against them because they say that everything is against them because like I say they've got this nihilistic streak in them. There's a heavy amount of nihilism, and when you have a nihilistic outlook and you've got a nihilistic support group around you, people who revel in, in your nihilism and reinforce that nihilism then it's easy you can it's easy to see looking in how they assume that everything's someone else's problem every bad thing they've had happen is there is someone else's problem yeah and especially and this also ties into um the falsehood of the american dream oh yeah with the the nineteen fifties, every every white man, every white cis male, ha- will have a job that pays enough money for them to have a family and a good house. And then you've got the seventies version of it, which is every white cis male will have a good enough job to run a Playboy lifestyle. But yeah. that's not the case. It never it's, has been the case. It's, yeah, it's that whole I am about to be Im- I am imminently rich. Yeah. I'm not rich right uh, now, so, but because I'm a white male, I will be rich, or it's someone's yeah. fault. Yeah, but they're not. Yeah, and they're pissed. <laughs> and and they're pissed about that. The problem is, is that all that rage, all that, all that, um, I'm trying to think of a word that means that it's okay, all that rage that they rightly should have. Yeah, justifiable. All that justified... Yeah, yeah, thank you. All that justifiable rage is pointed in the exact opposite direction of where it needs to be pointed. It's pointed at everyone except for the people that has caused this dream to not exist. Which is... Rich white people. Rich white people. <laughs> <laughs> and they've elected... They and, and they well, have we been elect part of this. We elect more rich white people and it doesn't Who do change. they elect as president? Yeah, rich a white rich people. white person. Yeah, he's not going to help you. Um, uh, sorry if we got off a little bit off of critical correctness there, but um, yeah, but it, it, that's the it's this it, sort of rage, and then when somebody says, "Well, you know, these people didn't do this thing to you," I think you'll find it's the they, rich white people. But it's so like, but yeah. I want to be rich white people, so it can't be their fault. So it must yeah. be people telling me that I've got to be, you know, as so sort of like, you know. It's just basic human fucking decency. It's manners. So, people are telling when, me I have to have manners. How dare you? So, <laughs> when, <laughs> when, how rude what of I you find to ask helps. Me to have manners. <laughs> what I find helps when people say, "Oh, this is just political correctness." Is I I substitute political correctness for people wanting to be treated as people. Yeah, and that helps me. That that's. 
n- like I'm going to be a bit hyperbolic with numbers here, but I would say that 90% of the people who say, oh, stupid political correctness, are people who are actually really, really angry. Well, maybe not angry, but just don't like the idea of treating people like people. They don't realise that in their heads, but if Mostly, you actually yeah. pro- posit them to the light that, they sort of like go... There's the other straw oh. man where they just say, I don't want feminism, or I don't want, you know, Black Lives Matter, or I don't want, you know, religious tolerance. I just want equality. Yeah. And it's just but, like, well, how do you plan to make that happen? And they go, well, um, um, this is like, because then you need people to advocate for those groups. Who are you, you know, and these advocates you're referring to as feminism. You know, you've got people that are fighting for equal rights. Yeah. And making changes and making sure that, you know, people aren't discriminated against, you know. It, yeah. And when you go after the most basic things, well, you know, non gender to- non gender lose. Well, it's the thing, it's. And when people, people just lose their minds, and it's just like, well, you're yeah. going to be. Do you, do you shit in front of other people? Well, no, there's a cubicle around me, and sometimes the loo is in its there own little go. room. Well, in, in, in where I work, there are two loos. They're not gendered because they're separate rooms. People are going to go in there and, you know, use the facilities. They're not going to use the facilities in front of anybody else. So really, um, they don't, they're not gendered So because they don't need to be. If you go into a cafe, it'll have a loo. You don't go, a woman might have been in here before me or a trans person or a gay person might have used this loo before me. You go in and use the loo and you come out. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, I did once say, you know, sometimes, you know, if you've got men's and women's loos in an office building, say, you've got some urinals and you've got stalls. In a women's loo, yep. you've just got stalls. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you just, instead of putting in the urinals, you put in, say, one or two extra stalls. And you put in the same number of stalls in each bathroom. Yep. Then... If you're going into a stall, you know, um, what's the issue? Whether that person's exactly. trans or male or female or, you know, or you could, you know, just go, right, okay. Well, we clearly, it's probably better if they're just like separate rooms. You just have a little long row of rooms with a little thing on it to say whether it's occupied or not. And those are the loose. Yeah. How is that Wait. so earth shatteringly difficult? The thing that the majority of people want, right? Is oh, people it's, it's also to... the reason that men make jokes about um, women all going to the loo at the same time and they're being a cue for women's loos, but not in men's loos. Yeah. Because men's loos actually have more facilities than, than women's, women's. If you count up the yeah. number of ways that they can be used. If you've got urinals, like six blokes can use a, a wall of urinals that will take up less space than an actual sit-down cubicle. Yeah. So it's because there are always more facilities for men in a building than there are for women. It's not, mm-hmm. even, if, even if the rooms are the same size. Yeah. All that people want, right? I think I used to think that all that everybody wants, everyone in this entire world wants, is to be treated with respect. Yeah. And do you know how easy it is to to like treat people with respect? Well, it's the default. It's it's the <laughs> yeah, it's the default. You've got to go out of your way to be a jerk to people. Yeah. You really have. It's like it's the default. Uh, it. I will admit, it takes a little bit of thinking to rewire your head to get out of assuming yeah. things. And I will admit, I've spent most of my life thinking that the gender binary, the gender was binary. Mm. You know, um, and I, I used to take, I used to be very assumptive about things. I used to assume that it was a man, a man. You know, that yeah. for most things. But I don't anymore, and it takes just a little bit of, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's a certain amount of adjustment. Thinking. But like the next yeah. generation, it will be, you know, the next it's, two oh, generation. Yeah. If we do the work now, a generation yeah. or two, hence, it will just be as it. It will just be how it is. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, that's how women got the vote. I mean, you, you, um, I, you know, I can't imagine someone saying, you know, nowadays, I don't think women should have the vote. Hmm. Well, I mean, because, look at it this way, right? You know, I mean, it's, it's insane, um, yeah. and would be regarded as such. You couldn't get an MP stand up and say, "I don't think women should vote," but you can get a, a, an MP stand up and say, I, I, "There are only two genders," and that'd be normal. So the things change, and that you know, some things change for the better. And treating everybody with an equal level of respect 
is for the better. Oh yeah, easily. You know, you know those people that are spouting off it. What if they have a daughter one day? What if their daughter decides that they're trans? Mm-hmm. You know, it's you know basically these people that are spouting off this thing are sitting there in a, without anybody they care about having to go through that. They've got a level of detachment that allows them to say them, which human beings are very good at doing. Those people <laughs> not like me and my family. So, funny you should mention that because I was going to get onto the point I was going to just now, uh, mentioning them. Mm. Um, it's I've I've seen this is again I mean how easy it is, right? People I've heard so many people. This is a typical straw man argument. Oh, it's difficult to remember what people's um, preferred pronouns are. No, it's not. No. It really isn't. Not if you know them. It's, 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 not, it's, you it's, know them. it's not even as difficult as remembering their name. Exactly. I it's find like, a name well, h- far harder than a pronoun. Yeah, it it's takes like, me ages to remember people's names. Yeah, it does. You don't. It doesn't matter. You don't really need to know people's pronouns when you're out and about. Yeah. For random people, it doesn't matter about people's pronouns. People who you have you have conversations with. Yeah, that you need to know. Um, and it's easy enough to just ask, what's your preferred pronoun? Yeah. On Twitter, for example, people who do care about pronouns will put in their Twitter profile what their preferred pronouns are. Mm. So, like, the first thing you see when you load up their page is so-and-so's name, blah, 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 him slash his, him slash him, he slash him, or her slash uh, hers, and they slash them, etc., you know, it's 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 not difficult, and this is the thing that really aggravates me. It's so not difficult to actually be respectful to other people. I mean, there are people who don't deserve respect. I mean, but that's based on what they do, rather than you know exactly. What, that's what based their on choices they in their private life, rather than what they are. In. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you don't this, have this a problem remembering doctor or professor. This, this goes around to yeah. What what? How does how different? How difficult is it to add mix to the to that, yeah. Um, this uh, I've lost my train of thought there for a moment. But yeah, pronouns um, are just you know, I, I will, I, I, I will, I will be happier when it settles down. Because mm-hmm. this is a very new thing we're culturally shifting. It is, yeah, and it's it slow. Is. And mm-hmm. MX, uh, uh, you know, it's sort of like look it. It doesn't have too many pronunciation mix. Yeah. You know. I'd be happy with mix. I like citizen. <laughs> citizen <laughs> <Smith>. yeah. Citizen <laughs> James. Um, citizen V. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. You know, Ms. was a new thing when I was growing up. Yeah. Because there was only Mr. and Mrs. Yeah. And Miss. And then you had Ms. And I must admit, I, I always, Ms. when I was working more on the phone, I always liked it when if somebody, I was taking down someone's details for the first time, they went Ms. And it's like, damn right, I approve. Yeah. This is like, it's none of my business whether you're married or not. Exactly. You know, that only, you know, so that, that would only make a difference to a certain kind of very shallow person that would only hit on people if they weren't married or, you know, mm-hmm. just, you know it's just like, that's, that's just allows people to be more of a sexual predator or to, you know, to sort of be more icky. I like Muz. And Mix is just the same thing. You know. I know how, the problem with working on the telephone is you make an assumption based on someone's voice. Yep. And it's very hard to not do that. Friend of mine... And, the, and I came unstuck a couple of times on call when somebody with a masculine voice phoned up and the account was in the name of uh, somebody that identified as female. And because we were governed by a certain amount of security, it's a bit of an obvious one if if what sounds like a male voice is trying to change details on a female account. Yeah. Which means that we have to check because it's the first thing if anybody tried to contest it. Well, that's obviously a man. Mm-hmm. And making the psychological jump to this is a person of any gender, you know, is, is a difficult one if you're dealing with things like data security over the phone. Yeah, without that's why we making that's why a note, we don't. And I didn't want to make a note on a contract saying person is transgender, 
Yeah. This is why we don't have business. a. Yeah. This is why we don't you This is why the tone of someone's voice isn't used as a, mm. a security measure. But That's you can't. We have things you like, can't help it. It's a natural assumption, which is. Oh yeah, no, it you is. Know, yeah. and, you know, I have I have schooled myself in. You know, and apologised for it and said, "I'm really sorry. Yeah. I have to just make absolutely sure." Because you know, I can't tell from your voice, and I, you know, I just have to, you know, and you have to ask, which is unfortunate because I would rather respect someone's privacy. Mm. Well, you you just m made me think of another thing there. There's mm. another reason why people uh, like uh, like to complain that political correctness is a is a thing that's bad, and there's a politically correct culture. They're people who don't want to apologise for being wrong. Oh yeah, that's probably it. Yeah, that that's you know, it's like if you if someone says if someone was to say to me, "Oh, Mister So and So," blah blah blah, and I would say, "Excuse me, it's it's mix." They go, "Oh, political correctness gone mad." And they they don't they just don't want to apologise for the fact that I've called them out on making a faux pas. That's what it is. We're living. I, I hear so much that we're living in an entitled society, a society of entitlement. We're not living in a, in a society of entitlement. We're living in a society of defensive babies who well, won't in, own up yeah. to their own problems and their own mistakes. That's what. That's the main. That's a bigger problem than yeah. people feeling entitled. People not fucking taking responsibility for themselves. There are some entitled people out there, but it, that's not a, an entitlement. To be asked to be referred to as your preferred pronoun isn't entitlement yeah, per that's se. That's not entitled at all. In no way is that entitled. Uh, so that's a, I would say that's a fucking basic right. And I'm sure the lines will move as time time goes on. I yeah. think entitlement is more expecting someone to provide a service to you. I can't tell. Because I'm of who you are. Yeah, that's the kind of like you should run around after me because I'm more important than you. That's a, a level of entitlement. It's yeah. the sort of like it's the people who are, who get angry with slow traffic, or someone that gets angry that something that they want to eat isn't on a restaurant menu. Yeah, that as well. Yeah, this is the it's menu. This is what that's... we provide. You can ask if we have it, but there's no point in kicking off if we don't. Entitlement like is, is going into McDonald's and asking for a steak. And then yeah. throwing a paddy because they don't do steak. That's entitlement. Yeah, that's a, you know, Getting... or expecting someone to, you know, sort of provide sushi because that's what you quite fancy when you're in a McDonald's or some shit like that. Yeah. And kicking off and making everybody's lives difficult. Yeah. To be asked it's to be not treated in... with a degree of respect is not an entitlement. Exactly. It's not being. Yeah. Exactly. Being asked to be treated with respect is not entitlement at all. And of course, the the what we're getting is uh, we're getting the the alt right trying to co-opt that term to make it to change what the meaning is they're, they're using it in a well, different way to change its meaning it's a bit like a social justice warrior is now mm -hmm. a, an insult well it started off as an insult actually right you know and it's just it's sort of like the it started so somebody... off as an insult and it still kind of is but there are people who have taken ownership of that term in the same way that um black people took ownership of the n-word yeah um to try and take the power out of it yeah the same way that gay people will now use the term gay i don't know to refer to themselves um i would say there are terms like you know and i'm i'm gonna use this term in a way that i wouldn't use the n-word because it, yeah. to sort of prove a point i think faggot and queer Queer's yeah. been taken back. Queer has been taken back, and queer and now means something like, very powerful. Yeah. Um, but and I've heard uh, in conversation people, you know, in the in the kind of using the n words sort of faggot use. Yeah. You know, in a kind of like you know between between gay people, gay yeah. people. I've a gay was. Yeah. I was never. I, I don't think I'd ever. I heard it used as a sort of playground slur. Yeah. But in the household that I grew up in, in the friends that my parents had and stuff like that, gay was just how someone was. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, you know, sort of like, words get sort of shortened by, you know, ignorant people. Sort of like things like homo. Mm -hmm. You know. It's, uh, you know, it's sort of like, you know, just think, well, homo. It's like, if you're really stupid, that you'd use that because it just means human, person. It's Latin for human. 
Mm -hmm. as in Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. And if you're particularly stupid, that would give you a snigger because you sort of like wouldn't understand that it's used as a as a um, a Latin classification in biology. Yeah. So yeah. But gay was never uh, never used as a slur in our house. I mean, sort of like. But I have heard you know people take back words that are painful slurs and put yep. them into common use. So you know when they're used, it's not a shock. Mm hmm. And that's how it is. You can't. The power that words have change over time, mm. and you can't take something straight away and expect it to be to the power that there to not be to not have gone. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm quite glad that queer got taken back because queer. Yeah, no, I'm I'm super just, glad that queer got different. taken back. You know, yeah. sort of that. That's not a problem. We're all unique. Yeah. So gender queer of different gender. You know, someone yeah. choosing to to not identify, but to basically step outside of heteronormative values. Exactly. And I'm I'm okay with that. You know, I'm quite pleased it got taken back and uh, sort of repurposed. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, what we're talking about here is essentially the, under the underscoring of it is the power of words. Yeah. And people don't want to be labelled with slurs. Yeah. You know, um, nobody, no, no cis white person wants to be called Cracker. I actually quite like being called Cracker. Okay, maybe it just you, sounds maybe funny. Like... It's just like you know, cracker. Okay, yeah, cracker. It's does just sound like in a funny. kind of friendly banter I, way. It's only ever been used in a friendly way to me. In a kind of I'm... like you know, you a poorly educated white person that has not really tw twigged, you know, cracker. And it's just like I, 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 I kind of think you know the amount of racialist you know insults, you know, um, that have been I think hurled that's it. around. I, I, I'm, in, just, I'm in... struggling to try and find a a yeah. a white racial insult. There, there really aren't any. But that's 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 your your, your indication of patriarchy, really, isn't it? For yeah. White yeah. patriarchy is kind of like the best that's ever been come up with is cracker. I mean, in I mean, um, Japan can be quite xenophobic, mm. and their harshest term for a white person is ghost. Yeah, that's or like foreigner. their equivalent of cracker or bar barbarian. You know, sort of. You know, um, there's, what's the Japanese there's a lot word? Of it's a, a gaijin, um, gaijin. Uh, gaijin. Is it gaijin? Yeah, which that is just basically means means non Japanese means... person, probably a barbarian. Yeah, and it is just like, yeah, but that's how you know there's patriarchy because if someone calls you a gaijin, even in uh, they're most angry, they're just saying white person. Yeah, they're well, not saying white people don't get hurt by that because they're you know yeah. it's white supremacy in action. It's sort of like you call me the dominant. You know, military and an industrial economic force on the planet. Mm. You know, uh, yeah, that's how you know it exists. That's that privilege. There isn't a bad slur for white cis male. No, I know it's apart you, from it's white like, cis male. <laughs> the, the, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, you change one of those things to be something else, and suddenly there's a ton of slurs. Yeah, white cis white female. Okay, you got bitch. Whore, slut. Probably should have put a bit of a trigger warning there to say that we're going to be mentioning those sort of terms, but um, you know, change. And then it again, to that's most... also example of control of someone's sexuality. I exactly. think your sexuality should be this. So yeah, I am, no, that, I'm going to exactly denigrate right, yeah. you. You know, this is like... another example of it as well because you've got the the whole thing of or come up with a, a come up with a, a, an impugn my you know mostly straight sexuality. Give it a whirl. Yeah. Find, a, find a word that around. means a, a man that a man that sleeps around. Uh, stud. Yeah, there isn't. Player. Stud. Yes. Yeah, stud. Player. You know. Winner. Gigolo. Yeah. Even even the, that, the, like the male form of whore is not a slur. Yeah. Gigolo. That's not a slur. That means. I know, suppose what the 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 homosexual. Oh yeah, you've got form catamite of a sex and, worker. Yeah. Rent boy. Yeah. Is a slur. Is a slur. Gigolo isn't. Yeah, all you've done is change the sexual preference, and suddenly there's a slur. And there. then it's a slur. Yeah. We. I feel like we need a big blackboard and an equation, something <laughs> like a giant yeah, equation just, of just slur just words. Shows everything. You know, like I once, I once read something which, which was just like it was so much missing the irony of it that just got me. Someone had 
Well, someone was having a discussion about feminism and patriarchy and that sort of thing, and the person who was against it said, "Oh well, by your logic, then then everything's sexist." And it was just like, "How has the light bulb not come on in your head and gone boom?" <laughs> because it is. Yeah. I mean, okay, not every single minute little thing, but the patriarchy is in almost is in nearly everything. It influences so much. Yeah, and that's why feminism is so important. Well, yeah, because, and racial and, equality, it, and you know, uh, sex workers' rights and stuff like that. You know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like, just like even even the problems, right? That cis white men have, right? Even those problems are caused by patriarchy. Yeah. Because it's all designed to keep everyone... It's designed to keep everyone who is rich and has power in having rich and having power. Yeah. And it's designed to keep the white pe the white men believing that they will have a shot at it. Oh, yeah. It's, it's That's the, all it's supposed to do. The whole American dream thing. That's why poor people voted for Donald Trump. Because yeah. the American... Um, there's no better word for it propaganda is that everybody in America has opportunity and everybody in America is imminently rich they're about to be wealthy if they just make the one right decision or come up with a good idea or do all that or you know or they'll win the lottery or something but like I'm that but I'm here to tell you the one idea um, uh, you know you know, the, maybe you'll win the lottery but your chances of being struck by lightning three times in, in your lifetime is much higher mm-hmm the propaganda, the current mode of thinking. It's a bit like all sex workers are there involuntarily. Yeah. You know, it's a bit like, you know, you might as well just say that a certain a certain race is lazy. Or, uh, you know, you know but just, but the white male Americans believe that they're one idea away from being super rich, which is why they vote yeah. for super rich people. If you say, right, I'm probably always going to be working class. For a whole bunch of reasons, mm -hmm. some of them fair, some of them not, you know. Um, and if you sort of basically say, "and this is my life," you probably get a bit more behind wanting things to be better for everybody. Yeah. It's nice if everybody, like from the moment you're born, you have equal access to education, you have equal access to wanting to to go for a certain career, you have equal expectations of not being sexually harassed. And you have equal expectations of um, being comfortable in your old age, and equal yeah. expectations of medical care. Now that wouldn't solve everything. People would still be unhappy. People would be in failed relationships. People would, you know, have, you know, difficult times. And people would be but depressed. The basic and things suffer mental would be illness just and solid. loss. But you, you would have some things you can rely on. And what? And I think it, you know, this lack of reliability that people generally know is there is what makes people angry. Mm -hmm. But the big thing is the biggest difference between the people who tell you what you should do and all the people that are supposed to do it is wealth. Yeah. You know, unearned inherited wealth and capitalism, the ability to, you know, the idea of a, you know, a, of a huge profit is exploitation. Yeah. You've exploited people that need a thing to make more money than the thing was worth. Now, in in essence, we still live in a situation where serfdom is still around, except that the kings are now the rich people. Yeah, who can run the businesses that we have to work at to be able to afford to live. Yes, and have control over the resources we need to live comfortably. Yeah, I mean, it's like look at everything that is that the UN has agreed is a basic human right. So, food, water, heat, electricity, mm. internet. Right? Internet is now a basic human right. We still have to pay for all those things. Mm. So no one on this planet is providing us those rights that we require. Yeah. We have access to them, but we're not provided with them. So they're not treated as yeah, rights. See, I'm, I'm quite happy for those to be paid for by taxes. Yeah. Me too. But also, you know, this inability to respect each other and respect each other's needs is the reason that a large chunk of every nation's GDP is spent on military and security. Yeah. 
if everybody had those things, if everybody is living a comfortable life with enough access to information, enough access to, you know, medicine, enough access to care, and has a roof over their head and they have enough food and stuff like that, and enough, dis and I hate to say it, disposable income to spend on things that they choose, mm -hmm. or enough access to those things, I mean, it doesn't, you don't need to necessarily spend money, but, you know, enough choice in what they do with the time that they're not working, then there really isn't much of a cause for war. No. And we, you know, it's an enormous amount of money. It really is. If everybody just went, okay, so let's not do this war thing. Let's sort out the energy crisis. Let's sort out, you know, make sure everybody's got enough water. And we have the solutions to those. That's mm -hmm. just there. You know, we have the technology to fix nearly everything. We, we know do. how to really do. turn places that are essentially deserts into gardens. We can do yep. that. We can do that with the right combination of plants. Frank Herbert was talking about in the 60s, and he's right. Mm -hmm. You can terraform. There's loads of desert in the world. There's loads of space. You know, yeah. there's, there's, there's loads of information. There's loads of connectivity. You know, uh, there are some countries that have fixed part of it. So Macedonia has free nationwide Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the only one that I know of that does. But that's a whole country that just went, internet should be free, and did it yeah. in about three years. You know, so if an access to education, well, access to education is just access to the internet. Mm -hmm. You know, but with people not being tight fisted or putting a dollar value on information, like a university degree, you could, you know, how many lectures do you attend in a university degree? I didn't go to university, <coughs> so I don't know. But I don't think it's like an enormous amount. How hard is it to post a reading list on someone's email? Read the following books and tell me the following things about them. Mm -hmm. Here is how to write an essay. Here is how to write a thesis. There is no reason you have to have face time with someone to learn these things. You know, fair enough. You might have to prove. You might want to prove that you exist and you're not a bot getting well, yeah. loads of loads of PhDs and shit. But you know, in in the same way as that you you know prove anything. That's that can be got round. Mm -hmm. You know, you exist as electronic data as far as your government's concerned, as far as tax and you know national insurance and things like that. So everybody could do a college course if they wanted to, but they could do it for free. So why can't we? Because exactly. once the information's there, it's paid for, it's done, it's you know accessible to everybody. You know, there's no reason. I'm not saying we don't need academics, but we don't necessarily need academics that we need to sit in a room with anymore. Yep. We have video technology. We can transmit that video. You know, Netscape has, um, Netflix has, has proved that, you know, you can stream video to everybody and it not be an internet bottleneck. I don't know how the fuck they manage that, but they do it really well. You need that well, technology to get lectures to people. Well, interestingly, there's, um, there's a website that, the YouTuber Lindy Beige is um, sponsored by, um, which Audible. just does no, not Audible, uh, the Great Courses Plus, yeah, which just does lectures, yeah. Well, and it's well, just like a big there's, thing. There's of absolutely lectures. no reason that you couldn't do a degree over a decade if you wanted to. Yeah, you just have to. Absolutely no reason. You know, and isn't it easier to employ people to mark an essay than it is to employ lecturers? How hard is it to employ people that just mark essays? Yeah, I mean, you you need to all you need to know to mark an essay is whether the person makes all the salient points, whether it's written comprehensively, mm -hmm. and whether it looks like they've learned what they needed to learn to pass that degree course. Well, that's not very fucking hard. I mean, you could get an AI to do that. Yeah. You've already got a little bit of AI that checks your spelling when you type into most word processing programs. You know, yeah. it wouldn't be hard to actually start writing uh, your essay in a format that the AI would understand. It or just get the AI really to be wouldn't. smarter. The AIs are mm -hmm. already contesting parking tickets and shit. You know, so that level of education, there's no reason you couldn't educate someone to be um, an agronomist or a, a, a metallurgist. 
mm-hmm. for nothing. Oh, well, no. Wouldn't that be, you could do what this is the thing when it's like that you can do what you want, you could be what you want. Yeah, there are things I've wanted to and do in my AI life and I haven't been able a, to do. Yeah, the AI will not give a fuck if you're black or gay or you know anything. Yeah, there you know, but I think that's the thing you know, institutions like you know are upholding. I mean, this is patriarchy again. Yeah. If if um, this was a thing and we needed more engineers, they would fix it. But mm-hmm. they want more men engineers, so they want to be able to see and shake the manly hands of the person that's going to be this, you know, NASA engineer or some shit like that. Yeah, they don't want the best person for the job. Aren't they? No, they want someone. The they want. Uh, they want someone that makes them comfortable and that, you know, comfort. Someone's, you know, change the person that's picking the people, and you'll get the best people. Yeah, but that's what patriarchy is. They intend to maintain their power. We could be on fucking Mars right now if we just had the best people. There's someone mm-hmm. sitting in a in a you know in a in a barrio in you know in Brazil that's dirt poor but is bright enough to be a NASA engineer. There's, that's bright enough to be someone that can help us terraform Mars or fix the world's ag- agriculture problems or make you know make things work better. Smart people are all over the place. Yeah, they're, they're all over the place, but they don't have the opportunity, and, and that opportunity needs needs to be presented to people without them panicking about where their next meal's coming from. And I guarantee you that you know, I think I'm pretty sure if you made that information available and you made it so that they could they would be secure enough to get their shit done. As a race, we'd be a lot better off. We easily would. We certainly wouldn't be spending you know trillions upon trillions of pounds on tanks and weaponry. You know, we'd be spending trillions of pounds getting, you know, viable mining in the asteroid belt. We'd be spending that money on solving the world's killer diseases and gene therapy and making sure people get to live healthy and very long lives. But, you know, but, you know, and when you mention gene therapy or T cell therapy and shit like that, they bring in religion. That's when religion gets mentioned and you have to be, Mm. you know, okay with people's, you know, an individual's belief in their own personal invisible friend. And that's that's sort of like maintaining control of a population. Why? Fuck, if we've only Mm -hmm. got the one life to live, we should be absolutely going to our potential. You know, if you're you're interested in doing a thing and you get to do it and you're the best at it or you're good at it enough to sort of make the world a better place by you doing it, then the world would be a better place. We can also make all the boring shit. Yeah. You know, the growing food and, you know, <laughs> all that bollocks. The generating power. That's what we've got computers for, but people don't because, you know, oh, well, we'll lose jobs. We're losing jobs anyway, you know. As, yep. it, as it economically suits big corporations, they're automating, whether we like it or not. There's already some economists who, believe, who, who are predicting that... Um, a lot more people are going to lose their jobs before 2020 is out hmm. because of um, because of people because of the jobs are coming automated. Yeah, you know, lots of this is why it's so important to have the universal basic income. Yeah, we need it like yesterday. Hmm. We need to automate the jobs that don't really fulfil people, and then really concentrate on the shit that does fulfil people. But it's this lack of opportunity to uh, to find out what you're good at or what you're interested in. Yeah. Well, you need basic tools to be interested in anything. You need literacy and numeracy. You need, yeah. you do need maths and language. The problem I had, the problem. This is why I never went to university. Is because there's so many things I I I'm interested in. Yeah. That I could have followed any one of those paths, but I would not have had the time or the money to become to go to university for every one of them I would have had to cho- have chosen one mm. and the time I would have had to chosen I didn't know which one I want I didn't know which one I would have loved would have enjoyed the most I could have spent so many grand on doing something that I didn't like yeah you know and it's it's that's the problem with it you know I don't want to be doing something I don't like but yeah I, I mean, want to spend like Six, four, four to six, eight years learning something I hate, but I didn't know I hated it until I started. It. You know, it's that sort of problem. That's that's why. Well, yeah, you know, I would I would have liked to have studied a lot of different things at various different levels. 
Mm-hmm. I'm sure there's probably a subject out there out there I could get my teeth into. I mean, I quite liked programming. Yeah, but you know, I th- I, I think it's inefficient. I, th- I think that learning all the all the um, the uh, syntax the com- is yeah. a massive waste of time because it changes After- so often. Yeah. And I'm not very good with remembering very specific things. But if you paired me up with an AI, I bet I bet we could develop some interesting programs that did shit. Hmm. Well, here, this is the thing, isn't it? It's like what 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 did we have? But when sorry, when we had the really intelligent boffins, and I've seen so many people say, "Oh, we need to return to the we need to return to the the strength of the British boffin." The people who were boffins were very weird right. people. They were very well, different well, people. <laughs> not only were they very weird, but what else were they? They were also quite well off. Yeah, because they had, had the, the money. The luxury of being able to go to university for six yeah. years. They had the money and the time to not only go to university, but also just pootle around and do whatever they wanted. You know, the, the people, the backyard inventors of the of the day, the people who were interested in, like, Doing scientific experiments, most of them weren't working in labs mm. or labs owned by companies. They were working even in their own lab mm. or a lab owned by a group of people, like a so- sort of socialist lab, and or you know for the government, which was again they were just allowed to do whatever they wanted to try and further science. You know these people weren't working for companies to do these things. They were allowed to do things at technically at their own pace in the mm. su- in the search of truth. A philosophers have never worked. You you never ever would have seen a philosopher sat inside an office room just sitting reading all the time. You wouldn't have done that. You'd have gone off and done. You know, the philosopher used to go off and do other sorts of things while they thought about everything. Yeah. And what we've got now is we've got a situation where businesses are the most important thing. Oh, yeah. And everybody has to conform to this, and everybody well, has to work working in working class education is. It's to prepare you for having a job. Yeah, it's, it's prepare not, you for having a job. It's not finding out what you're really good at. Yeah, it's sod. What, sod you, you could have been the next Mozart, but sod it. Yeah, you, you're now You're going to be fish. a working class. You've been, yeah. bo- you've been born into a working class life. You're going to be you're going to live as a working class life. Maybe if you're lucky, someone will discover you. Maybe if you're lucky, your parents will buy you a Casio keyboard when you're young and you'll actually prove to be really good at it and you'll get an Atari ST when you got older and you become the guy who was that one-hit wonder did um, your woman. Oh, White Town. White Town, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, they did... That person did a lot of music, but and they got famous. But the only th- the only things that well, it's, it's allowed him to be like that imminent richness. Yeah, the you're, only things that allowed to him rich. to do that. Yeah. I I can almost say that that I almost guarantee you that person didn't do it for the money. He did it because he liked making music. Hmm. And we've got people who know what they want to do and they can't do it. We've got people who are really good at the things they want to do, and they can't do the things they want to do. Because they have to have jobs and they have to have a stable income. Yeah. It's one of the reasons, um, you know, there are people that just don't really want to do anything. Yeah. They exist and cool. You know, that's great. But if you if you had all this stuff open to you and people were taught to want to do what they wanted to do, not fit their ambitions to what class they're born into or what gender they are, yep. if you just had, you know... Right, okay, every university lecture that's ever been made is out there. And what we're going to do is we're going to teach you to find out what you're good at. And just give someone mm-hmm. a range of activities. Now, which of these activities? And you have very generalised stuff. Which of these activities did you like the most? Yeah. And they go, well, I quite liked playing with the building blocks. Okay, now... Did you like, and then do some other exercises related to that? Did you like the building blocks in the kind of you liked building something, or you like the physical action of putting it all together? And then you can find out something more about who they are. Hmm. And you know, sort of like okay, so and then you, you know, it's it's a bit like if 
there's that argument that sort of say nobody would ever uh, if you gave someone a million dollars and said now what do you do and they then say oh well I'd like to re restore old cars then that person would be better being a mechanic and nobody ever says mm -hmm. janitor because nobody would want to clean up people's crap all the time yeah however if you said like the price of doing what you want to do is not littering you know if you don't litter Nobody has to work as a janitor and we can all design space stations or whatever the fuck it is we want to do. Or we can all make films yeah. or we can all do this. Mm -hmm. But the price of that is, okay, so it's a bit like going back. Ages and ages ago, I came up with the idea of the economies of free. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, you don't, if, if uh, you didn't want to pay any bills, your electricity company would give you the first 30 kilowatts a month free. Yeah. But then you pay for anything else you used above that. So... The 30 kilowatts, I mean, I'm using a shitty, a shitty figures there, but say, I don't know, 300 kilowatts. And that's enough to run your freezer, your washing machine, your fridge. It'll turn on lights for, you know, eight to 10 hours a day. Um, you can run a computer or, or run an entertainment system for as much as you want. If you then want to yep. leave all the lights on all night for no good reason, um, then you pay for the extra electricity that you use. Yeah. And the same with water. If you are responsible with your water, you never get a bill. If you're responsible with the gas that you use, you don't get a bill. Yeah. And if you're responsible with littering, we don't have to employ people to pick that up, which then frees us up to go and do the things that we want to do. We'll automate the growing of food. <coughs> and we'll have some people that like being technicians looking after that. So they'll look after the robots because they like looking after robots. And the robots mm -hmm. will fuck off and grow our food. And we'll keep them, you know, to the point where they are still machines and not living entities and shit. Mm -hmm. And the moment they become living entities, we then have to ask them what they want to do. Yeah. It's interesting you mentioned this. Cause, um, <laughs> you mentioned about the we are, the only reason we have janitors is because people litter. Mm. Reminded me of... Um, I was watching one of these police documentary car chase things yeah and they they were asking one of the questions they'd asked was how do people respond to you um when you nick them or give them tickets how do drivers respond to you when you give them tickets and one of the police officers said well oh, people sometimes say to me don't you have anything else better to do and their response is, yeah, I was doing something else more important, but then you broke the law in front of me. Yeah. And I had to go and deal with that. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like, it's that same thing. People don't want to deal with the petty things. They don't want mm. to have to pick up after other people. But the problem is, is that people only think about themselves and not other people. Mm. So they do litter. They do think, oh, I'll just run this red light. Yeah. You know, there's a reason why they why they've had to resort to fines for that, because people were just taking the piss. You yeah. couldn't just say, "Please don't do that," because they were taking the piss all the time. It's sad. It's a really sad state of affairs. You know that we have to have that sort of thing, but again, it's it's privilege. Yeah, well, that that's proper entitlement. Yeah, that's proper my, entitlement. My my desire to get somewhere thirty seconds faster than you is more important than your safety. I was standing by a bus stop yesterday, no, the day before, sorry, to go to work, and um, someone was smoking a cigarette. Two people were smoking a cigarette. There were two people who were smoking cigarettes. The bus came along. One of them turned around to the bin that you, they were stood right next to, put the cigarette out in the bin. Their friend just flicked the cigarette butt away. Yeah. Not even near the bin, just away down the road. And that's the difference. It's like that's, that bin was less than a metre from them and they couldn't be fucked to put the cigarette butt in the bin. Yeah. That's... Um, and I'm, not, I'm only using smoking as an example because I've just seen it recently. It's the most freshest memory in my mind of this... Of two people... Who in friends who have like completely different opinions on how I deal with um, stuff, you know, or two people who knew each other. Yeah, it's a depressing you know, thing that sort of like if everybody just took a little more care, yeah, 
we could reshape how people do stuff. I mean, the, the, just the gigantic amount of money we waste on defense is not yeah. necessary if we upgraded everybody to a to a basic level of, of comfort. Yeah. You know, that's that's all you need to do. Which is insane. You know, it's just like, well, why why aren't, why haven't we all got like a nice old age? Why haven't we all got decent medical care, enough food? You know, it's because we're we're programmed. You know, it is and it, it is breeding programming, which is really outdated. There are enough people on the planet, yeah. Okay, but we're still motivated by we need to look after our young. We need to be doing visibly better than everybody else. You know, we need to have mm -hmm. more stuff than the person next to us. We need to feel superior, and it's sort of like, well, you know, we're in the digital age now. Why can't we be, you know, feel superior by our output? Yeah. And the reason being is that there is a, 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 a cognitive dissonance between mm -hmm. what you actually do and how much money you have. The people that have lots and lots and lots of money spend most of their time attending meetings, agreeing on what they're going to tell people that don't earn as much money what to do. And the people that don't earn as much money actually make the stuff. Yep. And they found when the wages of the people organizing and the wages of the people doing are more in line that everybody gets along a lot better. Mm -hmm. But when you have, when, you know, you've got an executive in a company earning in two hours what the cleaner in the company earns in a year, yeah. You have a problem. You've got a massive problem. And, uh, you know, and going back well, to the political the correctness it? idea, the, the, yeah. the, the patriarchy and the people that say, well, I don't see why I should have to do anything with that like level of entitlement. I don't see why I should have to learn someone's preferred pronoun. I don't see why I should have to accommodate somebody else's viewpoint. Mm -hmm. It's like, a, like an entitlement. We're white, we're rich, we're in power. And we should call the shots. And yeah. all that goes so, back to is because I, you know, for to become more attractive to the opposite sex, I need to be the big shot. Yeah. And that goes all the way back to I'm the guy that managed to hunt the boar. You know, I killed the boar with my spear. There go, you know, I look like a better breeding prospect to the women of the tribe. Yep. And all it is is a, is, is a you know, it's a massively outdated, it's been out of date since agriculture yeah <laughs> it really has since we didn't have to risk life and limb to get food this has been out of date so i don't know when you want to count that from but it's around ten thousand years about i'd say yeah and the only reason it's now becoming a thing is because all those people that you've marginalized by you know making them other or different or boxing them into little pigeonholes where they don't matter now those yeah, people they can, can communicate with each other and yeah, they're finding really out that easily. an awful lot of people think it's bollocks. Yeah. And for the first time ever in, his, in, 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 in recorded history, a person that's been marginalised has other people that are in the same boat as them and is organising and using an overly complicated system against itself. Mm -hmm. So they're using political power against itself. Where was that was once the privilege of the elite to vote in Parliament? You've got people saying, and they've had to slowly make it sort of like in in, in theory accessible mm -hmm. because of other people because people aren't as divided as they think. Yeah. There's a lot of crossover, and there always has been. But now you've got women MPs, you've got MPs of colour, you've got MPs of immigrant parents you've got mps that are just sort of working class people because they had to pretend that it was an open system and now mm -hmm. people are exploiting the fact that in order to look good they made it look open and they're they're, they're slowly widening the the accessibility now the white male privileged class is going oh but this isn't very fair i feel like i'm being exploited and it's like you don't know anything about exploitation <laughs> <laughs> yeah it not being exactly as it was for you yeah a little while well, ago it's, it's not, not even been that it's, it's not being exactly as you thought it used to be yeah sorry yeah it's not it's, being exactly you know, as you thought this it perfection was. that sort of like um you got your oh we got to mention the men's rights activists are pushing yeah this perfect 1950s before women were liberated oh god so, it never existed it that, never that, existed that whole thing i i've spoken my partner 
is American. Yeah. And, and they know, they know is the, the whole of, she's done a lot of stuff about American history. Yeah. There's, there was an American TV show called Leave It to Beaver. Yeah, that's how Americans see the past. But it's it's false. It's all 100% false. Oh, you know, happy do you days. know National Lampoon's Vacation? Um, yes. With Chevy Chase? Yeah. Wally So World. it's based... It, yeah, it's based on a... Um, a story that... I think it was Harold Ramis who wrote it. Not Harold Ramis. The guy who wrote... Or is it John Hughes? I don't think it's John Hughes. Harold Ramis. I think it's Harold Ramis. So it was based on Harold, a short story that Harold Ramis had written called Vacation 50, uh, 56. Yeah. Um, which is much darker. Well, if, than you, if you watch Harrison Berger on, um, it's set in the future, but they've regressed America to this idealised 1950s. Well, yeah, it, it's 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 there's a really interesting video about vacation, and it goes into um, it was Harold Ramis. Oh no, John Hughes wrote the screenplay. Sorry, it is John Hughes. It's yeah, John Hughes. Vacation wow. Fifty Eight. Yeah, it's John is Hughes that an actual wrote. film? Vacation. Vacation Fifty Eight. Is there is there a film no. of that, or is it a story? No, that no, it's a, it's a short story that he wrote. Yeah. Um, I'll dig out the video for you that's really interesting. It talks about the history of vacation and how it came about. And it goes into the lie that is the American 50s. Yeah. And how it is a lie and how um, how Vacation 58 was sort of like shining a, a, a lens onto the American, the lie of the American dream. Mm. And Vacation, the film, in some respects, is a lighter take on the same thing. And it does shine a light onto the falsehoods of the American dream, but it has a happy ending at the end. Mm. So it kind of works out. So it doesn't really... It's not as critical of the American dream as Vacation 58 is. Uh, I think it was... I think it's a video by the movie Bob. Um, mm. I will have to dig that out for you. Oh, okay. Well, I think we've, got, we've probably wrapped up our discussion for today. But yeah. Yeah. I think what we'll do, actually, is I might... Um, I might, if it's re if it's okay with you, I might actually add that video link to the Recomedia. Oh, do yes. Um, I'll email you. I found the link to it, so I'll email it to you right now. Okay. okay, it's part of the Movie Bob's that really good series where he goes and watches, he goes and comments on films that are known about that are the traditionally called classics, mm. and comments on are they really that good? Cool. So, I'll uh, link that. It's about yeah. half an hour long. So we'll it's add, pretty good. Okay, so that's in the links. Um, yep. Do you want to go through the links and I'll do the Recomedia? Yeah, sure. Um, I've also... There's also the... Um, also the other one that I've just linked here, which is um, the article by um, Dale Baran. Yeah. Uh, for Ch and the skeleton key of the right to the rise of Trump. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm also going to throw that in there because it's a really good read. I spent, yeah. like, I read so, that on Saturday. It was a really good read. So, to anybody listening, um, if you if this is the first time you're listening, um, the running order with all the links in, we will describe them, but will be on the archive.org, and there will be a link to that on the YouTube thing. So yeah. it, it exists as a as a word document, and you can click on the hyperlinks if you scroll through it, and you'll get to the end where the links and the yeah. Wikimedia are every week. There's a um, an article on how to make. Um, Fin oh, sorry. Some Finnish liquor liqueur taste tests. Yeah. It's been proved with digital whiskey. Yeah. Um, there's some. There's a uh, website about U.S. veterans, which is thanks to Iron Angel. Yeah, task and purpose is is quite an yeah. interesting. It was also talks about depression and uh, what veterans are doing and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and there's a. Yeah, there's lots of different sections of that. Yeah, there's an an interesting one about um, veterans and suicide, which is. I've got a personal thing with this because a friend, not my friend of mine, hasn't gotten to the point of thinking about committing suicide, but he is ex-military. wasn't actually fighting. He wasn't a soldier. He was um, an engineer, uh, a specialist engineer. He's like one of those sort of engineers who, instead of he's not like a, he's not a, like a mechanic. He's an engineer who he makes things for things. 
and his role he can't tell me what he did when he was out there yeah but he he's one of those sort of engineers been part of the people doing mean things to other people and seeing the oh, sort of like yeah the, he the was out there he on a society it. of war which he's is always going to be happens, stressful yeah he's seen what happens when ieds go off and how it leaves people and he's told me how he, um, the ennui he's had and massive depression he's had trying to adjust to um civilian life and how he was he mentioned one of the most powerful things he ever told me was when he went to the supermarket soon after coming back from afghanistan and he went down one of the aisles to get some uh, I can't remember if it was either biscuits or, or shampoo or something. And there's just like so much choice on these shelves. So much for him to choose from. He couldn't make a decision. Mm. He could not decide on what he wanted. He, he was just, he lacked the ability to make that decision. He just, he almost broke down mm. at that point because it was so distressing for him that he couldn't. Because, you, you know, the military training, you could just accept what you're given. Yeah. And uh, suddenly having to make a decision or not. And just having that moment where I don't know what I like. Yeah. No, I've... And I think that it's it's a real a shame that it's, it's something that that the military doesn't do and should be doing. And I think it's a, dis a discredit to everyone who serves in the military. The military, every military, should be helping their veterans rotate back to society. And they're not doing that. They the, have the veterans... at least rec recognised that that's what can happen. They do have a, yeah. like a... Well, yeah, post-traumatic stress is now being treated seriously. But also they have a, a kind of cool-down after deployment. Yeah. They deploy you to somewhere that isn't a war zone, but you're still in under nominal military um, jurisdiction mm -hmm. and let you blow off steam for a few weeks. So you're not immediately coming home to your family and stuff like that just after seeing all that. And yeah. they, you live, you're kind of on base, but you're looking after yourself. Mm -hmm. But you're still with your squad mates. So they do, do now, you know, in the British Army anyway, they do now step you down slowly when returning from an employment. It's still not enough, but they yeah, have recognised that that sudden trauma of suddenly having to decide when you wake up, what, you know, what you're going to eat or drink, when you're going to go to bed, all that shit. They do realise that that needs to be gradually stepped back down again. Yeah. Because it's not the natural state of people to point guns at other people. It really isn't. You know, we're not... Humans don't really want to do it. Mm. So, you know, they are... They, they're improving. It's still nowhere near as good as it could be. It's things like, you know, but I don't know how it is for American troops, whether they just do, like, drop them off at their lo their hometown, which, mm. um, you know, go see... Go watch, go watch uh, First Blood. <laughs> see how that can go wrong. Yeah. But yeah. And were there any other links you wanted to add in? No, that was, a, that was all I've, I've added by two. Okay, so I'll make sure those are in there before I upload everything. Um, Recomedia wise, there's a uh, good video on Boeing Boeing of an Indian space mission launching 104 separate satellites, like a single rocket. Oh, wow. Uh, with a whole bunch of major satellites and loads of micro satellites to monitor global warming and stuff like that. But it's amazing. I love it when, when India and China just do space. It's just like, <laughs> it's like, of course we're not going to have to develop everything. You've already done it. Uh, we yeah. can just copy what you did. And uh, shortcuts. Who would have thought, you know, like even 20 years ago that India would have a thriving space industry. They really are doing the technological thing. I'm awesome out there. Yeah. Um, um, there was another thing. Uh, there's uh, a video of, on B the BBC thing of Sky Taxis. Just basically drones. <laughs> so somebody... In control of it flies you from one place to another and that's being introduced in Saudi Arabia I think in the oh, next wow. year so you get into a little pod with these propeller fans on it and it will take you up to uh, 50 miles okay that's pretty by cool. air which is pretty cool that's pretty sci-fi um, Narlox and I only watched this today and I got it last week but after we recorded the thing um, sent me a YouTube link which was on vice the vice channel on YouTube about a bunch of people squatting in mansions in London. Yeah. That just literally, habitually, um, part of their job is they, they take in homeless people to mansions. They got some, mm -hmm. and they um, basically train them to be professional squatters and also the support network for people that are homeless. 
So oh, they, wow. they um, skills wise, they tool up homeless people, make sure they get fed, give them somewhere to sleep, and then train them to be part of the organisation. And um, yeah. so they've got people casing empty mansions in London, you know, like millions of pounds worth of homes, just move yeah. in and uh, do it all over again, which is really interesting. That's well worth a, a, a watch. That sounds really good. Um, I'll check that I out. watched. I also watched the founder, which mm-hmm. is um, Michael Keaton as Ray Kroc. The guy that formed the McDonald's Corporation, all right, which is different from the McDonald's brothers that formed the system of serving you a burger. Yeah, and that's a very good insight. It's he's it, not really made out to be a hero, but it's just like a, a fairly accurate like portrayal. It's a bit like watching um, the Steve Jobs movies. It's mm-hmm. usually the story of this behemoth that came out of one person having an idea. He yeah. doesn't come across as the best person in the world, but it is interesting how mcdonald's works and it's not how you think so if you want to know how corporations get started and how underhanded it all is it's a very good thing and uh if you need sort of time off from thinking i watched uh, john wick the other day have you seen that Mm -hmm. it's the the movie equivalent of tight of coloring in (laughs) if you thought arnold schwarzenegger's commando hadn't much of a plot that's nothing on this movie. <laughs> if you watch the trailer, oh you kind gosh. of watch the movie, but it is really, uh, there's something awful about it, but it is really relaxing to watch it and do tidying up. Because you can <sighs> drop in and drop out of it and nothing will have changed. If you watch the first five minutes still the and same then go thing. off and do something, the movie is still kind of going on while you're <laughs> watching it. There's no point after the first five minutes that you can't dip into it and figure out what's going on. It's awesome. Yeah. It's literally bad guys kill his dog and he just kills everybody. It's hilarious. Oh my gosh. Watch it. You'll just be in stitches. It's a bit like, I don't think that was why it was made. You know, this sort of kind of like, it's a bit like um, hacking yourself as an audience member. Yeah. You know, hacking is taking something and using it for a different purpose. Yes, yes. This is a movie that you can use for a different purpose. It's a bit like Grizzly Man. You know, like on the face of it, it looks like a tragedy. Yeah. And then you watch it and it's actually a comedy. Okay. It's like you as the audience member hack the artwork. You enjoy it as you want to enjoy it rather than as the director wanted you to enjoy it. Okay. So, you know, I don't think Werner Herzog meant to make a comedy, but it is funny as fuck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Stupid got corrected by nature. Hooray. Um, well, and John Wick's kind of like, we're going to make a really hardcore action movie for straight white men who go, fuck yeah. Uh, yeah. and uh, include explosions and gunshots and stuff like that but it really is it's, it's like chewing gum so you can wander mm-hmm. off and do other things it's kind of good because you know when you're in the mood to watch something and you don't really want to tidy up your place yep you put that on and it, it kind of makes you want to go and tidy up or do something else while you're watching it because this really doesn't require all of your brain to watch it, uh, yeah you know you know when people used to say you only use 10% of your brain this is a movie attempting to prove that it's not true, but you know, it's kind of like that. I, yeah. I thoroughly recommend it, and, and I never thought I would. I just watched it because I was curious, and it is a brilliant tidying up movie. It's a movie you could probably go away and do the laundry and come back. Probably have just enough mm-hmm. time to see the end of it, and you won't have missed much in between. And uh, given recent politics, the Cory Doctorow books, Homeland, Little Brother, and Pirate Cinema are required reading, I think. Oh, I've I think I've got... I'm not sure if I've got those. I'm... Um, I bought the oh. Humble Freedom Bundle recently, and I, I think All it's right. got some Cory Doctorow stuff well, in it. Well, Cory Doctorow, praise be to the Doctorow, um, actually gives away all those books for free on his own I'm website. Just... Yeah. Okay. So if you want to download them as ebooks, he allows people to make ebook conversions of all his books. And when one comes in that's properly done with all the footnotes and everything in, it goes up on his website. And he would yeah. we, he's one of those authors that would prefer you read his stuff to buy it. Um, if you do read it and you've got a spare bit of spare cash, you can donate back to the website and they will buy a physical copy and give it to a school. Oh, wow. So you can read it if you and, and all of those. I have bought a few copies um, for friends, children. So if these mm-hmm. are they're kind all three of them are kind of like uh, young adult fiction. Yeah. But you'll you know, he teaches you about hacking, about repurposing computers, squatting. Um, the political oh, process. Here we go. This is what I've got. Information doesn't want to be free. Yeah. 
So, but you can get all those for free and with the author's blessing. But if you do have nice. spare money and you want to wake up a young person somewhere in the world, mm. they will pay for it to be put in a friendly school library for hopefully uh, a teenager to stumble across. Nice. You know, they are very, really good. very, very good books. It's all fictional, but all the books also have links to how you would do the thing in real life. So hacking or building yeah. a computer, the laws on squatting, uh, how to oppose political process and stuff like that. It's all mm -hmm. in there. So I thoroughly recommend those. And if you have young adults in your family circle or anything, you could do a lot worse than point them in the direction of that. Yeah. And that's all I've got for you. We've got some outro music, but I haven't prepared properly, so I, it, it won't be on there. It will be on the running order. So if you do like the music and you want to support the band, their links will be on the uh, their, their name will be on the running order. And all the bands have YouTube channels. So if you want to find out more, most of them are German Shepherd Records and Shameless Promotion. So yep, away you go. And that's our show. That's it. It is our show. I just want to give a shout out to the guys in the IRC, even though oh, nothing's been yes. said from the folks in the IRC. So we've got Ham Gammon, Iron Angel, mm. Kevin is a Geek, yeah. Effort, Misanthropic Gods, Mr. Yeah. Echo, Nolox, Pioneer, and Step John. Yeah, um, Mephit was the guy that wrote Pain for Ramp. So oh, really? He actually produced Yeah. That's nice. why I'm so, so stoked. And Misanthropic Gods, Gods has been a supporter of Ramp um, since. He's real. Yeah. And does Newsreel, which is still going. So go and listen. If you like this and you want another fix so sooner than a week, go and listen to Newsreel. Um, yeah, Iron Angel is also doing a podcast about a, a game of the Morrow Project. Oh, nice. Which is post uh, so that's in. That's he's got a few episodes of that up on his website. So if you go in the RC, you can ask him where to get it, and he'll put links up. We and by the way, if you're listening to this and you have links so iron angel if you can include the link to the first and the latest episode or something like that or to the website it's on that would be cool uh, i'll probably ask him anyway and if uh Mephit's up to anything we want to link our own we want to cross pollinate we want to share audience so oh hell yeah hell link, yeah have uh, put links to our stuff on your thing and we put links to your stuff on our thing and we'll, we'll grow the audience again let's go up to thousands of people in the irc yeah thousands man and uh, yeah, so thanks very much for listening. Thanks for your patience. And uh, we'll be back next week. And more Rangers TV coming soon, as soon as I can get some time to film. I'm doing some filming oh, yeah. on Thursday. And if there's anything you'd like to see on Rangers TV specifically, uh, do let us know. Um, and I think that's it. I didn't come up with a recipe, so apologies to um, Digital Whiskey. I haven't come up with a recipe for today because today was kind of thrown together. I've had a bit of a week. And that's us signing off. Take care, folks. Look after yourself. Take care. Bye-bye. When you come in a busy, your haziness Show this world isn't free fall, but the mind doesn't know. Oh, oh, and yeah, you try to believe it. But this high will control until the life that you need it. I won't guide this ship home. home. Is a lot like home Yeah, it leads into nothing home it Breaks my soul And this home Is a lot like home Cause it leads into nothing home Breaks the soul Cracks my soul It's in the air you can feel it The eyes they don't lie And you destroy all you need it
And they wasted your time You try to take back all you hated By breaking your spine You're licking your wounds clean But all you taste is their lies Home Feels a lot like home But it leads into nothing And this hole screams a lot like home, but it leads into nothing. Home breaks the soul to you and me, cracks my soul. you won some great victory. Ah, perhaps you didn't notice. The Trojan beach belonged to Priam in the morning. It belongs to Agamemnon in the afternoon. You can have the beach. I didn't come here for sand. No. You came here because you want your name to last through the ages. A great victory was won today. But that victory is not yours. Kings did not kneel to Achilles. Kings did not pay homage to Achilles. Perhaps the kings were too far behind to see. The soldiers won the battle. History remembers kings, not soldiers. <laughs>